behalf of the uh, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, I want to welcome all who joined us in this rather unique uh, gathering, the continuation of uh, the work we've been at for the past uh, six years. I want to welcome my colleagues on, uh, on the panel, uh, who I've been privileged to work with uh, during this period of time. I think it's important to note at the outset uh, to spend uh, a few moments recognizing the good work that Asha and her staff have done in the intervening period uh, during the challenge. You've kept us informed. And I want to thank all the uh, participants uh, today. Uh, it's another first. Uh, and I'm sure the Congress of the United States is going to go to uh, this kind of technology on a regular basis. I personally would rather have you seated in front of us and have some personal interaction, but we're grateful that you're participating today regardless. I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues for a couple thoughts, but in anticipation of this meeting, <clears throat> I thought about uh, our vision way back six years ago when we said to ourselves, this, this panel and the ex officio members and the experts that have been so helpful to us, what if Mother Nature, a terrorist or a nation state, throws a pathogen at us that we're ill prepared for? And we came up with some dire consequences. And conceptually, we said there'd be trillion dollars worth of loss, there'd be some social and economic disruption. And I'm not sure that even we could have anticipated what this has done to this country. It has fundamentally changed everything we do, and there will be some changes going down the road in the future. I'm just give you a little anecdote that just was searing in my mind. It was out yesterday, and it went by a child care program that was outside with adults overseeing three and four and five-year-olds running around a playground with masks on. And then I thought about their older brothers and sisters who maybe had been in first, second, and third grade, and we're not sure what's going to happen to them. And right now there's a discussion and even an argument, should they go back to school or they shouldn't? And child psychologists say, my goodness, we've got to get them to continue to socially interact. It's a formative period for them socially, uh, intellectually, we can't isolate these children. And the list of consequences, and I'm sure my colleagues have their own reflections, to remind us how critically important our work is because of the social, cultural, economic, and personal disruption and the impact it's had on our country. So with those introductory remarks, I just want to say once more how proud I am to be associated with this effort how grateful I am to be associated with this bipartisan group of thoughtful men and women and grateful for the extraordinary staff we've assembled to take us down this path. We, we've got to make some change and hopefully the Congress will be more receptive in the future than they have in the past to the very specific recommendations and action plans we've had. But I'm sure my colleagues have some personal reflections. I'm going to turn it over to my, my dear friend, Senator Joe Lieberman. Joseph. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for uh, those uh, perfect opening remarks and uh, good morning to all my colleagues. So I, I want to really pick up in the same spirit as uh, Tom Ridge. Uh, it really has been six years uh, since our commission was formed uh, because of a fear that our government was not adequately prepared to uh, prevent and respond to a, a bio uh, event and we always define that in two ways a bioterrorist event and an infectious disease epidemic or uh, pandemic in october of 2015 um say five years ago we put out our <clears throat> national blueprint for biodefense and uh if you go back and look at it right at the beginning uh we say the nation is dangerously vulnerable to a biological uh, event. And then the next sentence is, the root cause of this continuing vulnerability is the lack of strong centralized leadership at the highest level of government. So we made uh, over 30 recommendations. The top three were to <clears throat> have a government uh, president really adopt a national biodefense strategy. Uh, in terms of centralized leadership, to ask the vice president 
to, uh, we kind of backed into that because we felt we wanted the leadership to be at the center of our government, uh, have the vice president oversee it, and then have a national uh, biodefense council to coordinate in the White House. Um, over the years that followed, we actually, thanks to wonderful work by Asha and her team, we actually were pretty successful at having a number of our recommendations adopted by Congress uh, and the National Biodefense Strategy, which we had asked for, issued uh, by President uh, Trump in the fall of 2018. The sad fact, however, is if you look back, um, very little of either the congressional enactments or the National Biodefense Strategy uh, were implemented. And so when um, uh, this coronavirus pandemic struck, we were just about as unprepared, dangerously unprepared, as we found we were in 2015. And uh, now I think we've got to really look back at our um, our recommendations in 2015 and see what the experience of the last month months, six months of this pandemic teach us. We've got some uh, witnesses uh, today, some experts really, um, who I hope will help us uh, understand what we can do in the short term uh, in advocating to Congress or the White House about how to get ahead of the uh, spread of the virus um, in ways that are not being uh, tried now, but uh, looking, uh, and as my colleagues know, I have been uh, really asking myself uh, lately as I, as I watch the, the continuing lack of leadership and lack of coordination in response to the coronavirus pandemic, um, whether our idea to put the vice president in charge can be made to work, how can it be made to work? And if it can't, is there something else better we should do, such as creating a, uh, or urging Congress to create a new department of uh, pandemic uh, or infectious disease prevention and response, or even to create a, a directorate, a little bit like the director of national intelligence, to coordinate all of that. Because if you look back at uh, even allowing for President Trump's shall I say, uh, unusual leadership style. Presidents come and go. The question is, is the federal government uh, acting every day, 365 days a year when there's not a pandemic to be ready uh, for what everybody will do when and if that strikes. We're in the middle of the nightmare now. We know it's gonna come again. We know, we don't really know how long this nightmare will last. Um, so uh, as we look back over the last several months, I keep asking myself, and unfortunately for Asha, George, our staff director, I keep asking her, who's in charge? I mean, the vice president was chosen by the president to head the coronavirus task force in the White House. But really, uh, that, wasn't exact, that wasn't the kind of role that we had in mind for the vice president. He was there like the chairman of a, a temporary emergency committee as opposed to a driving daily force to get ready and, and uh, implement. And uh, really the number one person, I think in the mind of the country in responding besides the president has been Dr. Fauci. But uh, leaving aside for a moment, the fact that Dr. Fauci and President Trump seem not to be getting on with one another. Uh, Dr. Fauci is a researcher. He's a great researcher. He's a national treasure, but, he, but he's not an operational man. Where is the Center for Disease Control? Uh, and where is the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary at uh, Department of Health and Human Services, who on the statute book would seem to be the person who is actually right now should be in control of, of uh, it should have been since January, February of the response to the coronavirus. Definitely our friend Bob Cadillac, Dr. Bob Cadillac, not, not in control of all that, assigned to something, piece of it, an important piece of it, trying to expedite the coming of a vaccine and therapeutics, but not in charge. So I don't think anybody's really in charge. And um, I, I hope that we can play a role as advocates 
and urging the Congress, perhaps even the White House, this one or in the next uh, term of this administration or Biden uh, to, uh, to, to make us better prepared uh, for the next time. And I, I think our witnesses today are really tremendously well suited to help us decide what we can do immediately and whether we should think about a better uh, federal leadership organization for this uh, uh, prevention and response to infectious disease pandemics. Uh, thanks very much. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Senator. And uh, Senator Daschle. <clears throat> Well, Tom, you and Joe have said it so well that I, I really, I think in the interest of time, we ought to uh, move to our witnesses. Let me join you in welcoming our witnesses and thanking them for their contributions today. And as you have already said, uh, thank Asha and her staff for getting us, getting us organized. I, I just, two words keep coming to mind as I think about uh, where we are today. Uh, and those are, if only, if only our recommendations had been all implemented and adhered to and, and financed and supported, uh, I think we'd be in a far different place today than we are, unfortunately. If only we had taken those recommendations as a country and nationally a lot more seriously and given them the priority they deserve. But as I look at the future, uh, I would just reverse those words. Only if we do that, only if we put this uh, whole set of circumstances in our proper perspective with lessons learned and a recognition of how critical it is that we change and reorganize and give higher priority to these, to these uh, many, many challenges we face. Can we avoid this catastrophic set of circumstances going forward? Only if, that's partly what today's all about, is to figure out what only if means as we apply these circumstances to public policy going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Jim? Good morning. Thank you, Governor. Um, I'll be brief as well. Uh, as others have indicated, uh, this commission has done an extraordinary job in looking into the future and making some very, very valid uh, predictions. We, we said all along it was not a question of if this was going to happen, but when it was going to happen. We predicted some of the dire consequences that could happen uh, if we didn't um, take the precautions we needed to. We outlined what many of those precautions should be. Um, so we've, been, we've done an extraordinary job, thanks primarily to the experts who have testified before us and our staff uh, and our ex officio members. Uh, so it is really appropriate that even in the, in the midst of this terrible uh, global pandemic and, and economic disaster, that we, again, look into the future and say, what's next? Um, what could happen? Um, what could be different about the next uh, uh, pandemic or event? Um, will, will it be a, another novel virus? Will it be a, a bacterium uh, for which we've not been uh, prepared? Or are they going to come in tandem? Um, we're already seeing uh, with the coronavirus that secondary infections from uh, microbial resistant um, bacteria are uh, a very um, important uh, cause of death. Uh, and in fact, putting COVID aside, and in an, an average year, if you will, uh, more people die from that, from those infections from um, uh, bacterium that are resistant to antimicrobials uh, that have died so far from COVID. Uh, sadly, that number is probably going to be eclipsed relatively soon. Um, but this, these are the kinds of, um, of, of really dark events that we have to anticipate. Um, and I think we need to seize upon uh, this moment in time when people realize we weren't crying wolf, um, that this needed to be taken seriously, uh, that more resources need to be applied, more organization that we can do that. I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, Governor Ridges, my fellow Pennsylvanian, Dr. Neil Clancy from the University of Pittsburgh, who's going to talk also about this, um, about COVID-19 in light of these conditions like uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and uh, with that, I shall yield back to the governor. Thank you very much, Jim. Ken? Thanks, Governor. Just uh, I'd like to join my colleagues in saying um, how much I'm looking forward to today's proceeding and also how proud I am to be part of this group. Um, it really has been one of the most fulfilling things I've done professionally in my career to be with this team of uh, great teammates, um, working with Asha and her team that have just been tremendous. 
But then I think another aspect of uh, that I've enjoyed is just each of these sessions where we have a number of experts who get up and talk passionately about their area of expertise and really uh, demonstrate a level of dedication that you just don't see or at least don't appreciate day in and day out. And even before the pandemic set in, but you know, several years back where you're hearing epidemiologists and uh, folks who are specialists in bioweapon systems and the like, talk with passion about what it is that they're studying. And you realize now that we're in the middle of the, this pandemic, what fueled that passion? They understood the stakes. They understand how important their work is to saving lives and, and protecting us. And um, anyway, it, it gives new meaning to what it is that they say. And I think it gives new uh, force to the argument that we really need to be listening to the experts now. And so I'm um, very honored to be part of a a group that's bringing that expertise to the fore, and we've got some great experts talking today about epidemiological and biosurveillance capabilities. So I'm really looking forward to hearing. Uh, but I, I want to just sort of add one other thing. Besides listening to the experts, another thing we need to do is we need to make sure our government is being open to new ideas, reforms, reorganizations. And just to join with what Senator Lieberman said, um, look, we, we need to be thinking outside the box, and the government has not done so so far throughout this pandemic. We need to be using this pandemic as a teaching moment to think not only about how we can address today's crisis, but the inevitable crisis of tomorrow. And uh, so I'd like to use this session and then our work as a springboard to be thinking and urging the government to think about proposals like the one that Senator Lieberman just teed up because uh, we can't get to the next pandemic as ill-prepared as we were at the outset of this pandemic. So. Thanks again for being with us, and I look forward to hearing what the witnesses have to say about this critically important topic. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Thank you, all my panelists. We're going to move into our first panel session entitled Emergency Management and Hospital Preparedness. And I'm going to do something a little bit different this time around. I'm going to ask the individual panelists to give us a little bit of your background personally rather than me reading. You're all very well credentialed, uh, but I think it's more impactful and, and we don't want you to be humble. You're very credentialed. Talk to us a little bit about your background so we understand. And I think Ken hit it uh, so passionately about the, 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 the wisdom, the experience, and the commitment you bring to this enterprise consistent with what we've seen for the past five to six years the experts that we've attracted to this, to this group have been passionate about their concern because they all, they're more prescient than the political institutions and political people were. You foresaw the dire consequences if this dangerous vulnerability was left unattended. And so, again, I want you to uh, just don't be shy and don't be humble. I'm going to ask uh, Jared Moskowitz. Uh, Dr. Dan Heffling, and then David Mitchell to introduce themselves. But first, Jared, we're going to start with you. Governor Ridge, thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Daschle, uh, and always uh, nice to see uh, my old friend, uh, Senator uh, Lieberman. Uh, how you doing, sir? Uh, so yes, obviously things in the state of Florida have changed dramatically over the last several weeks. And so, uh, you know, we, we are now dealing with uh, similar similar issues, obviously, that uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, and the Northeast dealt with, uh, you know, early on when this pandemic started. And so, you know, you know, right now the challenge is facing the state of Florida. Uh, some are uh, on the ground issues. So obviously, our number one issue right now, obviously, is hospital capacity. So right now, uh, in the state of Florida, we uh, ne don't necessarily have a bed issue. We have a staffing issue. Uh, and so, you know, right now we're in the process of deploying over 1,500 nurses based on contracts here at the Division of Emergency Management to help support uh, our hospitals. Uh, hospitals have uh, surge plans based on their comprehensive emergency management plan. You know, they have the ability to expand within their hospital. Uh, and so they are, all, they are going ahead and, and doing that. They're getting rid of their elective surgeries to make sure that they can expand, similar to like what they did uh, in early March and April. Here in Florida, we have a lot of experience with with how hospitals are supposed to do that because of hurricanes, obviously. They've enacted their comprehensive emergency management plan here in the state of Florida, probably more than any other hospital system in the country, decompress the hospital, get rid of electives, and make sure, obviously, uh, that, that they have the capacity. 
Uh, the division procured uh, 5,000 hospital beds, 250 ICU beds, just in case we have to surge into a hospital. We have mobile ICU units that we literally can pull up uh, and expand outside the hospital. And then we have alternative care sites, uh, one in Miami a Beach that uh, right now can accept 450 people. Uh, and we can expand that up to 1,000. And we can work with our partners at the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to expand alternative care sites if, if that became uh, something uh, that, that was needed. So that right now is, is basically our number one challenge. Uh, obviously, you know, remdesivir uh, seems to be in short supply. Uh, you know, doctors want to give this to as many people as possible. And so that's something that we're working with our, with our federal partners on to make sure that there's enough remdesivir uh, available. Uh, you know, thankfully, PPE right now is, is not a big issue. I was uh, someone who, you know, really pounded the table early on PPE and what was going on in the PPE market. You know, that is a national security issue, in, in my uh, opinion, not just PPE, but whether it's ventilators or medication uh, or all of these things that were found that we found out that are made not in this country or a significant amount of them are not made in this country and we're dependent upon manufacturing uh, and importation and dealing with other countries who at that time can pull different levers uh, to cause to cause problems you know that's definitely a national security issue and so going forward I, I do think uh, folks in Washington DC are going to have to figure out uh, a way in which we bring manufacturing of these critical supplies, these critical needs back to the country, or at least enough that we could be self-sufficient uh, for, for a period of time. Obviously, you know, globalization has, uh, has, its, has its point and has its, has its part. We want to make sure, obviously, that the world, you know, doesn't have to deal with poverty and famine. And that, that's, that's the good part of globalization. But we also have to be somewhat self-reliant. I mean, this is the first time uh, in history in the country that all 50 states are under the same declaration, emergency declaration. So I'm not just competing against 50 states for resources, I'm competing against every country but Antarctica uh, for resources. And so uh, the idea that we then have to go to China or Malaysia or Indonesia or Turkey, uh, all these other places to get gowns and masks uh, and those things, uh, you know, that can't be uh, something that we deal with uh, in, in the future. Let me tell you another challenge uh, in emergency management. Uh, and that is not necessarily operational. It, it's in the political. Um, this is the first disaster that I can remember uh, in my time doing disaster management in which uh, there are two sides to this disaster. You know, when a category five hurricane hits, nobody says it wasn't a category five, it was a category two. Nobody says, well, it didn't hit the panhandle, it hit Miami. These are facts, we don't dispute them. Uh, and, 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 and here in the state of Florida, we're used to that, we're used to, having a disaster, the community coming together, this disaster is split people uh, right down into their jersey uh, on, on what color they wear. Uh, and that is a significant problem. And it's a significant problem. And I'll just point out the mask issue. If you had told me that masks would be the political football of 2020, I would have lost that bet. And so, you know, we can have mask mandates. Those are great, whether they're done by the state or they're done by the counties. But if a significant portion of the population doesn't want to wear them, doesn't believe in them, challenges the science, has an alternative fact when it comes to just wearing a mask, um, that is, a, that is a, hard, a huge issue for us because everyone wants to know, well, why are these surges happening? Did they open too early? It's not that they opened too early. It's that the phasing didn't work. The phasing didn't work because no one adhered to the phasing. Restaurants didn't do 25% or 50%. People didn't wear masks. Uh, the Band-Aid was ripped off and, and it was a letter rip strategy. Uh, and, and ultimately, I think that, again, you see something and you react to it. So people ask, did the protests add to the surge? Uh, there's no data that shows the protests uh, added to the surge. But for another segment of the population, when they saw all those people gathering, what they said is, well, why can't I do that at my restaurant or at my bar? Why can't I do that? Uh, if they're going to do that and they can get, get away with it and no one is saying they shouldn't gather, I'm going to go gather. Uh, and so depending upon where you get your media, what prism that comes through, whether it's Fox or MSNBC or CNN, that's now how you look at this disaster. Disaster messaging is so important. In a hurricane, we only have a limited window of time to tell them what is approaching and what they need to do. And we have to be accurate. 
We can't say you need to evacuate and then, oh, you don't need to evacuate. Or, hey, you don't need to evacuate, but now you need to evacuate. We got to be precise. And the, the, the communication on this disaster has been anything but precise. It is all over the board. And that is a huge challenge uh, for, for emergency management directors right now or anyone uh, in the health industry uh, trying to get people uh, to do the right thing, that this has become so political. Uh, you know, the federal government, uh, you know, has, has, been, has been pretty good on getting us resources. Uh, early on, when we needed PPE, we got those pushes uh, from, from the national stockpile, uh, and, and those came in, and those were tremendously helpful. As the private market was faltering, the federal government did prop us up, and they did prop us up long enough until the private market could come back in. But I got to tell you, uh, you know, the Production Act should have been used a lot more. Uh, the threat of the Production Act was good. It worked. It worked with 3M, uh, who was making about 35 million masks a month in country and then was selling masks all over the world uh, from their other factories based on previous agreements they had with Canada or Mexico. Uh, they weren't prioritizing uh, the United States. They were honoring previous agreements. And to be quite honest, there was a lot of shenanigans going on with their distributors of stuff going to the highest bidder. Uh, countries willing to pay cash, those sort of things. Uh, you know, the threat of the Production Act with 3M worked, uh, and they're now bringing in 50 more million masks a month from uh, their, their outside their factories. Uh, so the federal government was very helpful uh, to get us going. But, you know, if, when private industry, unfortunately, is left to make private industry decisions, dollar decisions, uh, they, we shouldn't expect them necessarily to act any different in a disaster than they do any day. So if I'm willing to only pay $5 for a mask or $6 for a mask, because I got to justify that to my taxpayers, but there's another country that's willing to pay 10 and they're willing to pay same day because they don't have procurement rules, they don't have financial rules, uh, and they're willing to pay them in cash, uh, I, I can't compete with that. And we, should, we shouldn't expect a private company to say, well, we're not gonna do business, we wanna take care of of our states no they're going to do what's best for their bottom their bottom dollar and that was happening globally very early on uh until the white house uh, uh and and the federal government intervened some of it was still going afterwards because we didn't use the production act enough um but 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 the federal government was extremely helpful uh on doing that there's some things that could be fixed there's not a lot of visibility so uh let me give you an example so when the federal government said to me you have 500,000 masks and 95 masks that are on a truck on their way. We would say, that's great. Thank you very much. When will they get here? The federal government said, we don't know. We don't track that. What do you mean you don't track that? I mean, FedEx can tell me when my package is coming. Uh, but the federal government couldn't tell me where the masks were, what, what, if they were in transit, and when would they arrive. They only did delivery confirmation. So they would only get a confirmation when the delivery happened. And then I would get a paper uh, receipt of what was in the truck when it arrived. Why is that important? Because it affects my planning purposes. How much am I getting? When is it coming? All of that day by day when, we're, when you're reacting to a disaster, everything is moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. And so if the federal government is sending me resources, but they can't tell me where it is, when it's coming and how much uh, until the truck actually arrives, that's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, you know, here in the state of Florida, obviously, early on since, since March, we've been preparing for uh, a hurricane, obviously, so far. Um, you know, we haven't seen any major threats, but, you know, August and September are around the corner. Uh, you know, that is obviously peak hurricane season for the state of Florida. You know, the team behind me has more experience than, than anybody else, uh, especially in the last several years between Hermine, Matthew, Irma, Michael, and Dorian. Uh, we're going to do things a lot different here. We've created a hurricane PPE reserve. We're going to be giving out uh, hurricane kits to people who come to our shelters. Shelters, which are done by the counties, are going to be done differently. Uh, we're going to have uh, non-congregate sheltering, which is we're reached out to hotels to provide shelterings. The state's going to pay for that, uh, put people in hotel rooms. These are, you know, hotels that are built to withstand the wind that aren't in surge areas. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to feed people. Uh, we're going to give them obviously PPE while they're in these hotels. Um, and then obviously in regular shelters, you're going to see a lot less people uh, in shelters because people are going to be socially distanced. CDC and FEMA on the Red Cross have said no more than 50 people per room. So instead of putting people in a big cafeteria or gymnasium, 
We're gonna, they're looking to put people in classrooms uh, to, to divide them out, temperature screenings at shelters, things of that nature. We're also changing on our messaging. So instead of, instead of just saying, you know, mandatory evacuation, maybe a recommended evacuation, I think you're gonna see a county emergency manager say, listen, if you live in a surge zone, you live in a flood zone, and you're in evacuation zone A, you are under a mandatory evacuation. You need to leave. If you can go to a friend's house, a family member's house, uh, non congregate shelter or go to a shelter in that order. That's what I think you're going to say. But I think they're also going to say, listen, if you know your house, you know your dwelling, uh, and you're not in a surge zone, you're not, you're not in danger of the water because water is the number one killer in hurricanes, not the wind, it's the water. Uh, maybe staying in your home is perhaps the safest thing to do depending upon, you know, the severity of the storm. Uh, and so everything's going to be very situational on how uh, on how we, we message that. Uh, and again, messaging is going to be very important. Uh, are people going to pay attention? Are people going to listen? Um, if you believe that COVID is not a threat, because that's what, how you get your media, you're going to re now react. That's going to affect how you react in, in a hurricane. If you believe that you can't go outside because COVID is airborne, because that's the media you're reading, then that's going to affect how you react to a hurricane. So all of this uh, is going to impact how, er, how people respond, behavior uh, on whether they're going to evacuate uh, or, or not evacuate or how they'll evacuate. You know, we're obviously telling people to get seven days of supplies. You could see things like power restoration slower than usual because you're not going to get the same mutual aid in uh, from, from other states. We could be feeding more people than we're used to after hurricanes because of the unemployment due to COVID. Uh, we, are, we, are, we, we, are, we had 11 million meals that we handed out in the month of June, um, you know, just with dealing with the unemployment. So, you know, the, these are all the issues going on with COVID, you know, currently in the state of Florida. Uh, but, but I can tell you right now, in my opinion, uh, the number one challenge uh, to how to respond is that this has become a political uh, issue. It is the number one issue. As a Democrat uh, who works in a Republican administration, I see both sides of this, okay? When I talk to my Democratic colleagues and I talk to my Republican colleagues, should school open, should school not open? It is divided down the middle. There is almost no moderate on this issue. You're either in one camp or the other on what we should be doing and should not be doing. Uh, and you can't respond to a pandemic when only half the population uh, believes in one thing and facts, and the other half of population uh, believes in another. So thank you very much uh, for uh, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Great. Eric, uh, thank you. I particularly appreciate, based on my own experience, uh, when you mentioned the importance of consistent uh, messaging during times of crisis. And the inconsistencies, as you've identified, have created some problems, not only in Florida, but elsewhere, clearly. Let's go to uh, Dr. Dan Hanson. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present to you this morning on this important topic of hospital and healthcare system preparedness. Uh, I'm Dr. Dan Hanfling, a practicing emergency physician who spent the better part of the past 20 years focused on disaster preparedness and response at the local, the state, national, and international level. In fact, uh, Senator Lieberman, I presented in front of your homeland a security council uh, soon after 9-11, uh, facing much the same uh, issues, uh, I think, as we'll uh, discuss today. I have traveled across the country and across the globe as a responder to most of the major catastrophic events of the past two decades. Uh, I was a part of the team at Inova Fairfax Hospital that successfully diagnosed two of the inhalation anthrax cases in the fall of 2001. Uh, I pushed back strongly against the CDC's initial guidance uh, recommending a lax approach to PPE utilization during the early days of the Ebola crisis and was proven correct when two ICU nurses at a Dallas hospital became exposed. From 2015 to 2018, I served as a special advisor supporting the National Healthcare Preparedness Program at the Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And indeed, I replaced the current leader of that office, Dr. Bob Kadlec, uh, who was the founder of this esteemed commission, uh, in his role as chairman of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine 
Forum on Medical and Public Health Preparedness, which I continue to chair to this day. And from January 2019, I've helped focus critical attention on pandemic preparedness from my vantage point at the intersection of national security and biotech at Incutel, our nation's strategic investment arm for the intelligence and national security establishment, where our small but mighty team have focused expressly on supporting <clears throat> the health security requirements that are fundamentally vital to our nation's overarching national security. And it's chiefly from this perspective that I will offer you these prepared remarks. Although my experience early in the fight against COVID as a bedside emergency department clinician, reusing a single N95 mask over the course of a two day shift, my thoughts now as a furloughed healthcare worker sidelined from the single greatest health emergency our country has known in over a century. And as an expert in hospital preparedness and response, having led the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine's development of crisis standards of care framework for catastrophic health emergency response are all going to be game for question and discussion. So let me begin. Challenges and gaps in preparing hospitals for responding to emerging infectious disease outbreaks or any novel event for which there's little existing experience, for example, a large scale radiation emergency, are many. The core recommendations from the 2015 Blueprint for Biodefense are as relevant now as they were the day they were published. And in the context of preparedness, these include A, full support of the HHS Ask for Hospital Preparedness Program funding at or above initially authorized levels established by PAPA in 2006. B, providing financial incentives that hospitals and health systems require to prepare for these events, including linking CMS incentives and reimbursements to new accreditation standards. And C, enhancing and expanding the pilot effort started in 2018 to develop a regional disaster health response system, one that establishes a regional hub and spoke model for preparedness and response based on combined statistical areas that already demonstrate existing economic and social linkages and ensures that private sector health partners are fully integrated into the traditionally government dominated public health response system. So here we are mid July 2020, nearly six months into the response to this terrible crisis. And where do we stand? Well, the bottom line from my perspective is that there is still no good dashboard that shows what a state is experiencing compared to normal seasonal volumes. There's continued confusion with regards to data reporting. And with regards to understanding what is happening within the healthcare system, there's more guesswork than there is certainty. As you are certainly aware, HHS paid millions of dollars for a contract that was supposed to get data directly from electronic health records, but it doesn't. In parallel, CDC has been using its National Healthcare Safety Network, uh, NHSN, with infection preventionists to report healthcare acquired infections and report some data on COVID. But it's nothing is really coming back from this information and it's not clear what the data is used for. And it has created additional manual work by hospital staff. The March 29th letter from Vice President Pence to hospital administrators requesting daily data reports on testing, capacity, bed utilization, and patients uh, created a burden of reporting in the absence of a viable national data collection system. And indeed, just four days ago, HHS sent out a notice that all information was now to be reported via the teletracking system and no longer be entered using CDC's NHSN. The rationale is certainly explainable to do away with a parallel reporting stream. The implications, however, are yet to be determined because we still have a push data system when what we really need is a pull system. The disastrous response to this novel coronavirus outbreak has demonstrated a clear need for the following critical capabilities. And I will outline for you three broad uh, requirements. First, we require real-time situational awareness and informed and improved decision-making capability. We need the ability to test, detect, identify, model, track, and report upon the operational consequences of large-scale disruptive emergency events <laughs> including emerging infectious diseases. Situational awareness means we have at our disposal the number and location of ICU beds, PPE supplies, availability of diagnostic testing kits, and so on. We need an efficient and coherent information supply chain 
that can inform decisions and help us learn what works and what doesn't. We need a system that not only provides us access to data, but also one in which it can be rapidly analyzed and reported. The US is essentially flying blind at the present moment, unable to generate even the most basic situational awareness with regards to health system status management detailed to the local level. 10 years after the implementation of electronic health records, we're mired in data pits while the promised data lakes are dry beds filled with fax machines and stacks upon stacks of paper. Immediate efforts to, to uh, address this uh, should potentially consider the use, for example, of the Defense Production Act to compel the major electronic health records, especially Epic and Cerner and others, to create the interoperability needed using the FHIR standard, the FHIR standard and HL7 pipeline, create seamless data feeds of critical information. These would include, again, hospital bed census, patient diagnoses, medication utilization, ventilator, and other key supply availability that would be provided to a national data coordination center. We have at our disposal 21st century data management technologies that we can employ to this end, incorporating advances in technologies, 5G communication technology that allows for computing at the edge, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to speed diagnosis and delivery of healthcare services, and data privacy and security protocols that allow for the safe, secure transfer of information where and when it is needed. Second, we need to take advantage of this crisis in order to develop a concerted push towards what I describe as healthcare over the horizon, in which we employ digital health tools that tilt the axis of care towards the individual, ensuring that what we create is used day to day, but is usually beneficial on game day. The use of AI-powered symptom checkers in order to perform self-triage, the use of wearable sensors and other means of capturing biometric information in real time, the incorporation of personalized genomic analysis and the use of rapid point of care diagnostics will all be critical in bringing the healthcare system response into the 21st century. The technology exists today to empower individuals in directing their own care while taking pressure off of hospitals leaving them available for those who are most in need of hospitalized care. Third, let's recognize that as bad as the surge is in parts of the country right now, it is likely to worsen significantly, particularly as we combine circulating seasonal influenza on top of COVID. So we need to ensure that there are enhanced supportive measures in place to anticipate and manage this added strain. One additional application of these capabilities would be to provide region-to-region real-time medical consultation, for example, in the realm of delivering critical care services. For example, if the New York tri-state area uh, critical care units, their ICUs, were not currently overwhelmed, why can't they provide electronic ICU medical oversight and real-time patient care support to hospitals in Texas and Florida? We need to be able to create these communication pipelines and protocols to allow for such services now. My lot of time is short, so let me close with an additional observation. I'd be remiss not to mention that the global health security that we so uh, dearly need is indeed um, inextricably linked to our own national health security. And we are that much more vulnerable to future pandemics and emerging threats by not contributing to and being more closely aligned with our global partners via WHO. There is an obvious correlation between the lack of information domestically, no visibility on real-time health system needs, no visibility on supply chain movement, APIs largely based uh, overseas, with the law of global situational awareness and an uncoordinated global strategy for pandemic preparedness that will be the legacy of WHO withdrawal. So now is the time more than ever that we need to be sharing information, for example, via the solidarity trial to accelerate a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine. Others are likely to address this issue, but I could not present before you this week without noting this obvious concern. And on the precipice of what appears to be a concerted White House effort that has begun to discredit Dr. Fauci, I must say, let science and our esteemed scientists speak truth to power. The only thing that we have at our disposal to get through this crisis, science and trust. Thank you. So on that uh, wonderful, appropriate, and powerful admonition, science and trust.
I think you'll find bipartisan agreement within this group, that's for darn sure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Doctor, very provocative testimony. We're now going to move to uh, our final member of this panel, David Mitchell. David, please, talk to us a little bit about your background and give us the benefit of your perspective. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, other esteemed members of the commission. Um, thank you very way, much for wearing a tie. <laughs> you know, I won't stand up. Right? It's the new, the new, uh, the new COVID attire. <laughs> um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today uh, regarding the ongoing response to COVID nineteen from an emergency medical services or EMS perspective. Uh, my name is David Mitchell. I'm the president of the International Association of EMS Chiefs. I'm the EMS chief for the Arvada, Colorado Fire Protection District and a co-chair of the EMS Incident Operations Coordinating Committee for the 10 counties making up the Denver metro area and the Denver UAC. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the commission with an account of the challenges that EMS agencies and the dedicated providers that work in them have experienced in local jurisdictions across the country. These issues persist as we continue to confront this pandemic with its anomalous impact on civil society. I have the distinct privilege of representing EMS agencies that differ greatly in their delivery model, their makeup of paid and volunteer staff, and their status as a public or private entity. A community's EMS system can vary greatly from one city to the next. One thing these agencies have in common is that they are staffed by the most talented, caring, creative, fearless, and dedicated army of healthcare workers performing their skills in the uncertain and risky public safety environment. I have the utmost respect for these incredible professionals, and I'm proud to count myself as their colleague and representative. EMS agencies may have different characteristics, but they report similar operational challenges and experiences in their preparation and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to describe challenges that pose existential threats to the current delivery model of EMS in this country. I'll touch on the following, unreliable personal protective equipment or PPE supply chains, financial instability followed up with inequitable provision of relief funding, and the fragile nature of current organizational and provider resiliency. I'll wrap up with some proposed changes to the current paradigm we're in, some suggestions as to what the most valuable recommendations this commission can make as we prepare to continue this fight into the fall and the years to come. One of the primary functions of an EMS chief is to provide for the health and safety of the people under their command. When we ask the men and women that work as EMS providers across the country to put their health and lives at risk, we must protect them in that mission by providing the PPE required to safely and effectively perform their duties. Throughout this response, I've heard from countless agency leaders about the difficulties they're having securing legitimate PPE in quantities adequate to provide for the safety of their workforce and their patients. Very early on in the response, it became apparent that our primary supply chains would not be able to fulfill orders that were placed as disease made its way to our borders. Quickly, logistics teams worked to secure PPE from secondary and tertiary suppliers. This proved to be a difficult task fraught with financial risk, in addition to the risk of accidentally purchasing illegitimate PPE. In some cases, local agencies were negotiating the importation of shipping containers full of supplies from all over the world. We were dealing in quantities and costs that were and are extremely risky. At times, we didn't know if we needed more intervention from the federal government or less. On some occasions, when an agency would think they were about to get lucky and procure enough infra equipment to protect their staff for another week or maybe even a month, the entire shipment and all subsequent orders from that supplier would be preempted by the federal government. All in all, it was and remains extremely difficult to plan beyond the short term. Agencies felt as though despite being in the same situation as our neighbors, on some level, we were competing with them to provide for our workforces. Accessing PPE, PPE has experienced some modest relief in the instant, but with the expanding patient numbers and increased PPE burn rates, most EMS chiefs report that this limited stability is not sustainable. The feeling of relief from finding PPE is quickly replaced again with worries about unbudgeted financial impacts. If you're willing to pay a multiplier between two and six times for the same equipment, you can find sufficient PPE right now. In this moment, most of the agencies I represent report that they have at least a two week runway of PPE, almost all of which was procured through these expensive non-traditional supply chains. I know this is not the situation for all agencies and I know that the nation's case counts are continuing to increase while hotspots emerge domestically and abroad. 
routinely my message to constituent agency leaders is to keep their foot on the gas and never stop working to provide for the safety of their staff by continuously searching for and securing PPE while they can from whomever they can. Secondly, the financial health of EMS agencies across the country is also at risk. It is at risk fundamentally as a result of the current reimbursement-based funding model, which does not promote investing in preparedness for low-frequency, high-risk events. EMS is reimbursed for transporting patients to the emergency room, period. Very few other services we provide are reimbursable. When the pandemic ramped up across the country, people stopped calling 911, and EMS agencies saw a substantial and in some cases debilitating decrease in call volume, which will result in months of decreased revenue. On average, calls for service dropped by 26% nationally and are still recovering. That paired with the extreme costs associated with just-in-time preparation for the current situation, agencies are left footing the bill now with the hope that at some point they will be made whole. Additionally, a disproportionate amount of of the allocated relief money available in the sector is available only to the governmental providers of EMS, leaving many private and hospital-based services and their communities at continued risk. Some considerations have been made for reimbursement of telehealth services, but if agencies didn't have a program in place, they're forced with, they're faced with developing a new line of service, purchasing equipment, and implementing a program amidst an already overwhelming response to a pandemic. In the long run, EMS agencies are stuck shouldering the burden of increased costs associated with a very atypical response. The challenges described above both relate to organizational and individual provider resiliency, as do a number of the other significant hurdles facing EMS agencies in this response. Healthcare workers and support staff across the spectrum are in the highest tier for occupational risk relative to COVID-19, but EMS being subject to the uniquely dynamic nature of its operations and its environment of care brings with it an exponential increase in uncertainty and risk. Our personnel are wearing masks nearly 24 hours a day while in stations and in ambulances. They are transitioning meticulously from surgical masks to full PPE ensembles with N95s, face shields, and full body protective suits, and then back to surgical masks, each time carefully doffing and decontaminating their equipment as to not expose themselves, their partners, or their families. The mental toll is significant, to say the least. They were not trained for this, after all. Initial and ongoing training falls short when it comes to preparing an EMS provider, or leader, for that matter, in how to respond to a worldwide pandemic. Infectious disease, is generally, in general, is merely a paragraph in a chapter on special considerations. Agencies prepared just-in-time training for the crews on the proper donning and doffing techniques, along with the information that we would glean for about the disease how it manifested in patients, how it would require the potential quarantine and isolation of providers should they not do some part of their routine exactly as choreographed. Some of it was developed back when we were completing the just-in-time training for a response to Ebola. It turns out that while we can work to bolster provider and organizational resiliency, we can't actually achieve them under the current set of circumstances. Resiliency is unattainable if you set yourself up to be surprised at every turn, if, you are consistent, if you're constantly reacting and providing just-in-time training and pulling off emergency purchasing due to a lack of access to critical information regarding emerging threats, you'll never reach resiliency. If you are constantly scrambling to fulfill the mission because of a lack of access to shared best practices or a lack of representation in critical planning meetings, you will never achieve resiliency. If you don't have the ability to develop targeted capabilities across delivery models based on identified gaps and sustain those capabilities from one infectious disease response to the next, you will never achieve resiliency. I'd like to close by offering a way forward. You will no doubt be familiar with my suggestions as they coincide with your own. In 2018, this commission published a document titled Holding the Line on Biodefense. In it, you described the current state of affairs surrounding federal leadership of a fragmented EMS system, and the first recommendation made by the commission in that document was to fortify EMS by developing a more robust national system led by a newly formed National EMS Administration within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The shortcomings and limitations of the current national approach to leadership of EMS, which are described 
in that document have unfortunately borne their fruit and are described above in the challenges I've laid out. The issues you've already identified with regard to the status quo are exaggerated under the current set of circumstances and have proven to be as or more relevant today than the day they were written. Immediate action would help us get through the long impending tale of the current COVID-19 response and build resiliency for the next biological incident, whether it be natural or man-made. While we are working on the lead federal agency, I would also ask for that you advocate to elevate EMS to the highest tier of prioritization in regard to PPE ordering, molecular testing, organized serology studies to determine prevalence of the disease among EMS workforce, and for the distribution of any future vaccine that may be, may be developed. I thank you for the time you've given me to advocate for the brave men and women that respond to calls for service across this country during this time of so many unknowns. Peace be with the families of those that have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community. And peace be with all of you. Thank you very much. Good, uh, thank you very much for your very forceful testimony. You refer to your colleagues as incredible professionals. And you probably don't know this, but I am exhibit A and B at least to the talent and the commitment dedication, but for their presence in my life on several occasions over the past couple of years, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. So uh, in terms of preparedness, training and response and recovery, you're spot on. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you, uh, my colleagues have the questions for the panelists and I would like to begin one by noting that at the, uh, listening to your testimony and taking a few notes, it seems uh, to the individual that there's a consistent refrain about certain things. Supply chain deficiencies, inadequate use of the Defense Production Act, and the notion that uh, to be in a competitive position in the midst of pandemic, to compete against each other for just critically, basically needed equipment seemed to be somewhat preposterous particularly when the Defense Production Act could have been employed, deployed much earlier in this process. So there's a lot of consistencies in your testimony. But I'm gonna to say to you, each one of you, you've all identified challenges, you set priorities and made recommendations. But if you had the opportunity to affect change in the next 30 to 60 days, in the delivery of services in the, in the national response to this pandemic, if you could affect a change, a single change with a snap of the fingers, because you have some long-term recommendations which we will build into a report, I'm quite confident of that. If, if you have, as David pointed out, we've already got some recommendations that we'd like people to follow. But you, since we know this pandemic isn't going away, this is still the first tranche, according to most epidemiologists. This is not a resurgence. We're gonna see it coming. So if you could affect a change now, in anticipation of that resurgence, but maybe even helping dealing with mitigation for this first phase, what would it be? Jared, I'm gonna start with you. If there was one thing, truthfully, uh, that could help slow the spread uh, right now in the state of Florida, uh, it would be for the President of the United States to come out and tell everyone to wear a mask. Uh, if you ask me one thing, uh, you know, that, 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 that it would be more helpful than if they sent me a thousand nurses, which I can get on my own, it would be more helpful uh, than anything else, uh, because you know at this point in the in the disaster, uh, you know the states have the ability to get a lot of resources that we didn't in March. Um, but if the president came out and told everybody to wear a mask, everybody to social distance, everybody to wash their hands, everybody to follow the phasing and the guidelines, that messaging, and if he hammered it over and over, which he's very good at. Um, that would be the biggest game changer. And two weeks after he started doing that, you would see a change uh, in the numbers uh, and, in, and in the thought process uh, and in the conversations that are happening uh, around the state, locally, around schools, around businesses. You and I learned at an early age, Jared, that actions speak louder than words. Uh, so it's nice if uh, they were consistent. Thank you. Doctor. Yeah, so Governor Ridge, I have to follow uh, Mr. Moskowitz's point. In fact, uh, just a few days ago uh, with a colleague at Incutel, we wrote a short piece about wearing masks. Be a hero, wear a mask. It's simple. 
It's straightforward and it saves lives. And it's something that everybody can do right now. So uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more completely uh, with regards to making that recommendation. I think the other recommendation uh, along the lines with the testimony that I provided to you is to coordinate the data, the data streams and provide the kind of situational awareness uh, that is required for intelligent decision making. So as, for example, as Mr. Moskowitz said with regards to the state of Florida uh, and the need for staffing, uh, I participated in a call with, uh, with Jared's uh, um, colleagues, uh, Mr. Nim runs the uh, emergency, uh, emergency management agency for the state of Texas uh, and his colleague from Louisiana on Sunday. And the same question uh, was posed, which is, where are the staff? We know there are people who are out there. How do we get access to them? Because that's what we need right now. So I would say masks and data, critically important. Before, you go, before I go to David, uh, doctor, is there within in the institutions with which you have dealt with over the past 30, 40 years an architecture, a means by which you could secure this data now simply by presidential directive? As of tomorrow, the following technical technology will be used. You're all obliged to use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and feed it into where would, what would it be? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a, it's a fair question. And unfortunately, the answer is uh, not as, as clear as we'd like it to be because there are so many, there's so many data streams that we've established over the course of the past 20 years. And in fact, just four days ago, as I, as I noted, uh, HHS issued a directive that they will now uh, request all information to come through the contract that they created with a company called Teletracking, frankly, a company that nobody, hardly anybody heard of prior to the COVID uh, outbreak. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a step in the right direction to unify and to coordinate uh, the single flow of data. Uh, we have the systems to be able to do this. The problem is, is that we don't have interoperability. And so I would say, yes, with a magic wand, if we could get, for example, just very simply, the electronic health record companies that have the vast majority of records across the country to coordinate and create a back end link that allows critical information to be pushed forward into this system so that it is a, it is a, a pull and it doesn't have to rely on people to manually enter data and send it forward. I think that would be a big step forward. Just a personal reflection. I think uh, on 9-11, one of the concerns within the emergency management first responder community was interoperability of communication. Two decades later, we use the same word because there's the same deficiency. Thank I, you. I, I mean, I can, I can tell you, you're absolutely right. And I can tell you in fact, in preparation for Senator Lieber, the testimony that I, that I presented in front of Senator Lieberman's um, Senate Governmental Affairs Committee, I was asked to discuss the issue of interoperability. I had to look it up in the dictionary. Uh, and you know that was 20 years ago, and here we are still talking about the same issue, uh, and, and we need to solve it. Good, thank you, sir. David. Uh, thank you. Um, if I had to choose one thing that I think you could change with the stroke of a pen, um, it would it would relate to the discussion I was having on PPE. Only being able to plan out two weeks ahead puts EMS agencies in a battle cadence in something that is untenable for the long run. It, like you mentioned, we're going to be dealing with this for years to come. If we're only ever able to look out two weeks in advance, we're constantly going to be nervous about running out. Our workforce is not going to have the confidence that we're going to be able to protect them. And if you could advocate for the federal government to acknowledge the risks that EMS workers are facing and to categorize them at the same priority level as other healthcare workers in hospitals or even those in nursing homes, we would be better off in our ability to order PPE and protect our folks. Um, stuff that's being uh, commandeered or preempted by the federal government is put into those supply chains that are going out and feeding states and feeding counties. But as it gets closer and closer to the local agencies, EMS is more consistently not in that top tier. And so we're not able to get them through the private supply chain because they're being preempted. And we're not able to get them through the governmental supply chains because we're not in the priority list. And so if you could change one thing, it would be to fix that discrepancy. Well, you're on somebody's priority list when they call you. That's for damn sure. That's for sure. Amen.
Thank you for your testimony, gentlemen, your responses. Now my colleagues have questions as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Lieberman. Uh, thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks to the three of you. Well, you've been a great panel. You know, as I look back at our 2015 report, I must say we were, we were unfortunately right on target, but it's not because we were geniuses. It's just because we listened to experts like you. And uh, it's because of the kind of testimony you've given us today that hopefully we can play a similarly constructive role, maybe more effective going forward. Jared, I'm really proud to see you. I met, I met Jared probably 25 years ago. Know his parents very well, they're dear friends. Tom Dashley, you'll appreciate that the Moskowitz has found out to be my friend, uh, has very good, uh, many aspects that are good, but it's also not inexpensive. And I think you know what I mean. <laughs> they were very helpful to me. You were great today, Jared. Uh, and uh, I appreciate what you said about the politics of this because it's so right. I thought Governor DeSantis deserves a lot of credit. He turned to a former Democratic state legislator with private sector experience in emergency management to take over. Let me ask this question because we're, we're focused on particularly how to, how to help the federal government help you. Has, have, what has been your point of contact? Have you had a single point of contact for Florida with the federal government or has it been confusing or, or has it been multi-faceted? Uh, great question, Senator. So, so to peel back the layer of that onion, right, different from, let's say, Hurricane Michael, Category 5 storm, one point of contact, FEMA. FEMA, uh, FEMA is the coordinating agency, right? They help coordinate uh, other agency responses, okay? This, not one single point of contact. It's FEMA, it's HHS, and then a lot of times there's a disconnect between FEMA HHS and what the folks uh, at the highest levels uh, and the staff at the highest levels uh, are doing uh, or, or, or controlling. Uh, going back to the supply chain, uh, the supply chain, uh, and I, there's a lot of good reasons on why, because if supplies are limited, you got to make sure they're going um, uh, you know, where they're desperately needed. And so you want that being done at the highest levels, not necessarily in, in the giant bureaucracies that sometimes slow things down. Um, but resources, the, the ones very early on, like N95 masks or even remdesivir now, that's all being controlled uh, out of the White House. Uh, and so we, we make requests to FEMA, we make requests to HHS, and, and sometimes we have to then, obviously I need the governor to go make that phone call. Uh, and when the governor makes the phone call, the resources then flow. So it isn't as easy or as simple as we're used to in the even major disasters uh, like a Hurricane Michael, uh, because things are controlled, uh, especially on things that are limited uh, by, by, you know, by, by the folks uh, at the top. And there is disconnects uh, going on uh, all, all over the place. I wanted to, to also add one, one additional thing because the inoperability uh, issue that was brought up. That issue is not just at the top or in the middle. It's also at the bottom. And I'll just give you a clear example. So I, I, you know, come from the city of Parkland. I was a commissioner in the city of Parkland. Nobody knew where the city of Parkland was on the map. Senator, you've been there. But then all of a sudden we had the massacre at my old high school at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Okay. Inoperability was one of the biggest failures of that response because police and fire and different police agencies couldn't talk to each other. Throttling of the radios couldn't respond. Um, the 911 services, there were different 911 services between the cities and the county. And so I, 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 the doctor brought up a great point. I wanna stress it. Inoperability is a problem at all levels of government and all the way down. And, and, and I hate to say this, and I'm just putting my old procurement hat on from doing it in the private sector and doing it as a city commissioner. When a city does a procurement and a county does a procurement and a state does a procurement and the federal government does a procurement and they award the four different companies who use different products who then can't talk to each other, that's how you add to the inoperability issue. Uh, and that is what happened to us locally in Parkland. 
different companies, different products, couldn't talk to each other. That's a really helpful answer, Jared. Thanks. Dr. Hemphlig, I want to ask you an answer. I want to ask you a question and ask you to write us the answer and response because I want to give my colleagues time to ask questions. And it is this, building on what Jared just said about when a, when a hurricane comes, it's FEMA, FEMA, FEMA. Clarity. Um, it, that was a reform that the Congress put into effect after uh, the, the terrible uh, experience with Hurricane Katrina that we regionalized FEMA services. You said something of real interest to me, which is well, one of the uh, reforms that's possible here is to have a kind of private public sector, private sector, regional infectious disease preparedness and response uh, apparatus. I just, I'd be really grateful if you could write us a little more detail about what you have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom, back to you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Senator Daschle. I uh, just want to join my colleagues in thanking our three uh, experts in sharing their uh, remarkable uh, insights with us, and we deeply appreciate the the, uh, the uh, good uh, information you provided us today. I I, I I can't help but think of how important uh, the whole question of leadership is as we consider these challenges, and how the lack of leadership and the lack of coordination, the lack of prioritization, has put us in this position. And I, I just would want to emphasize Jared's comment about politicization. The sad tragedy is that this whole crisis has been politicized. One of the greatest, greatest laments that I have about it, uh, as he has said so correctly, uh, past disasters have not been politicized. And uh, as a result, we pulled together. Uh, that hasn't happened this time, and it's just a tragedy. But I have a, just a fundamental question in the interest of time. I'll limit myself to one question. There's an ongoing debate about whether the response to the crisis should be state-based or nationally based, federally based, whether or not some sort of national plan is required or whether we really ought to leave it to the states. Uh, is there any consensus among you experts as to what we should how we should view the organizational structure as we look to future crises and pandemics like this. Sure, I can, I'll can. i begin, Senator. That is a great question. Uh, and a lot of times there's this thought process that, oh, the federal government, the federal government, the federal government, the federal government. Now look, there were things that the federal government should have done uh, that they could have done, like testing. Testing would have been a great way for the federal government early on to have a better plan uh, with better resources. But I gotta tell you, in emergency management, we like to say disasters are locally executed, uh, they are state managed, and they are federally supported. The federal government is very good at writing a check. They are very bad at providing a resource. So for, when we have to respond and moments matter and hours matter and days matter, uh, the federal government is too slow we at the state can do it much faster. Uh, now that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for them, like in this instance, right? Uh, you know, they got to help with remdesivir, right? Uh, that's not something that the states can do because then the states are all fighting with each other if there isn't a somebody at the top kind of figuring that out. So there is clearly a role for the federal government. Um, but, you know, if you said to me, should, the federal, should we federalize this response? in general, should, all things should be federalized, everything would happen slower, uh, period. Uh, and that's not because the folks at FEMA or HHS or Homeland aren't fantastic. They are fantastic. But even at the state government, like my agency is 270 people. We are built for speed. Department of Health is 5,000 people. They are not built for speed. Uh, and so the, lar the larger and larger the bureaucracy gets, the slower the response is, the layers it has to go through uh, to, to, get a, to get a decision. And so I don't know that I have a perfect answer to that because I think it's disaster specific. And I think within that disaster, there are certain things that the federal government should be in charge of uh, versus what the states are. Uh, but, but if the money flowed faster, from the feds to the states, that would allow us to respond quicker, reimbursement, 
you know, we're spending GR, uh, but there's a lot of states that can't afford to do that because they can't wait the year and a half to get their reimbursement. I mean, that's something that has to continue, in my opinion, to be refined. Florida, Texas, New York, California, we can spend money, but Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, West Virginia, uh, th these states don't have the GR to lay out while they wait a year and a half to get their money back from the federal government. So, um, you know, that's something I think that the federal government can really improve on is getting those dollars out uh, that allow us to, to do stuff. But there's, there's this, this is clearly something that even after legislation after legislation and discussion after discussion, we, we still have not uh, gotten it just right. So, so I, so Senator Daschle, in, in, you know, with, with respect to my colleague, uh, Jared, uh, who makes a lot of fine points and certainly uh, recognizing the role of the federal government as the check writer, for events as complex and dynamic and challenging uh, as an event like this one, an, an evolving pandemic, particularly an emerging infectious disease where we need the best science and we need the best evaluation and assessment that we can possibly get. It is really only through the federal government that we can establish the sort of coordination, consistency, and again, back to Jared's excellent points about risk communications, messaging based on what the science tells us at that time. I think my very simple answer to your question in terms of which works better is, look at where we are now. We basically, the federal government basically abdicated its role, the White House abdicated its role as a leader in terms of uh, directing the response and left it to the states and we had 50 different responses. And as a result of that, as Governor Ridge has pointed out, we never, at, and we never exited the first uh, wave. We're still uh, fighting this first tranche of illness because you know, we did not uh, pay the attention that it was due with the messaging that was required from the, the leadership at, at the highest level of government. Uh, Senator, I, I, I believe that I would tend to agree more uh, with the nuances laid out by Mr. Moskowitz and, and with, with a nod to um, what the doctor has mentioned, is the things that the federal government needs to do, they need to do them. You know, they need to be the leader in the messaging as to what is actually going on. They need to procure enough PPE for the localities and the local EMs to distribute to the people that need them if that's going to be the plan. But I think what we found was that the things that we expected the federal government to do, they did halfway or they didn't do it all. And that hamstrung us when we went to try to execute locally because we didn't have the tools that we needed in order to do that. And so I, I tend to agree with the local execution of a, of a, a larger unified plan uh, and, um, and go with that. Well, thank you. I, I'd love to follow up, but I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Tim. Thank you, Tom. Question for Dr. Uh, Handling. In our blueprint uh, from October 2015, there was a very specific uh, set of recommendations that had to do with tiering, creating a tiered system of hospitals, particularly in urban areas. Hospital A, you're going to be most prepared. The first X number of cases will go there, then BC down the line. And, and called for the prepositioning of certain kinds of equipment at those hospitals based on that tiering system. If you can imagine what a difference it would have made uh, in this event if in New York City, for starters, um, that was the system and the ventilators were all prepositioned and the hospital had been financially uh, incentivized to, to stockpile that kind of equipment and the PPE and all the rest of it. Um, my question is, this happened to be a virus and it happened to be a one that was a respiratory virus um, and so you can, it's easy for us in retrospect to say, well, why didn't, you know, just think if you'd had X number of ventilators there, how many lives would have been saved? Right. Um, but then, as I said in my opening statement, we don't know what the next event is going to be. So my question is, um, how uh, accurately can we identify the, if we did have this tiered system, which we need to do, what kind of equipment should be there sort of as generic, if you will, kind of stuff that you should have for this event as, uh, as opposed to something that you really won't know until you get there. Sure, sure, Thank, thanks for the question. And actually, Dr. George uh, will fill you in on background that some of the notions and recommendations about a tiered system, in fact, came from 
uh, a lot of the work that I did post 9-11 in creating uh, what we call the healthcare coalition concept, which is now, we started in Northern Virginia after the attack on the Pentagon uh, and then the anthrax attacks. And that has become the national model for the hospital preparedness program. So the program we started in Northern Virginia is really now the national model, which is a regional approach that links hospitals and recognizes uh, in essence, a tiered approach in that, for example, a academic medical center or a trauma center or other quaternary, tertiary or quaternary uh, referral center will be the best resource, but needs to link to the other hospitals in its geographic uh, regional uh, area to be able to support them and recognize that there may be a bi-directional flow of patients, resources, staffing, and so on. And uh, at least in the context of the Northern Virginia Hospital Alliance, which we created in October of, of 2002, we actually built out a separate logistics supply chain capability with a warehouse where we did exactly what you just uh, suggested, which is to identify key resources, including uh, at that time, uh, we bought 300 uh, EMS transport ventilators that, of course, uh, would not be sufficient for the most uh, ill, uh, uh, critically ill patients, but would be a temporizing agent until such time as we could get more sophisticated ventilators in place. We put in place a number of pharmaceuticals and a pharmaceutical stockpile, again, separate from anything that the state or the, uh, or the strategic national stockpile at the federal level was, was uh, you know, was, was in place. And we, you know, and we, most importantly, we put in place the level of communication and training and education to make sure that it was understood that these coalition were linked. Now, you know, at the present time, and I left uh, HHS, as I said, at the end of 2018, there were over 400 healthcare coalitions across the country. And when I left, uh, HHS was uh, building on, actually, Senator um, Lieberman's question, building on a pilot focused on a regional disaster health response system. So I think, that, I think that this is going to be critically important as we go forward, including the funding uh, and the means to be able to maintain a certain cash, a certain degree of resources so that we don't have to tap into, you know, Chief Mitchell or, or Mr. Moscow agencies to say, hey, help us out. And indeed, uh, when you look at the the composition of the healthcare coalitions, we are inclusive of not just the hospitals, but the hospital, public health agency, emergency management agency, and EMS agency as the four core members. So indeed, if there's a cache, for example, of PPE, that PPE might be equally useful for EMS responders. And it allows, back to the interoperability uh, question that we discussed earlier, it allows sharing, uh, it allows uh, joint training, and I think um, I think this is I think this is a notion that has stood the test of time, uh, and I think it needs now the funding and the support to really elevate it to the next level. Thank you, and I'll try to be quick here, uh, Chief Mitchell. Um, uh, my father, way way back, was the, the president of the Trevos Heights Rescue Squad. It was an all voluntary, all volunteer uh, group. There are um, still many volunteer squads. Uh, there are um, private paid and there are municipal um, paid. Um, how much at variance was their experience of those different kinds of, of uh, EMS responders uh, in this event? Um, uh, thank you for that question and thank your father for his service uh, to his community. Um, I feel that the, the disparate uh, delivery models of EMS absolutely affected their ability to respond and, re and will affect their ability to recover. Um, Agencies like mine, which are governmental focused and fire based, um, had some additional throughput and funding mechanisms that allow them to make adjustments and spend some money on, uh, you know, equipment that works to decontaminate our, our units and uh, additional PPE and the ability to even consider purchasing a, a, sub, uh, a uh, shipping container full of PPE, you know, requires some um, cash reserve and, and ability to be reimbursed. Um, and the spectrum goes on and on. The private uh, fire-based EMS accounts for only 40% of the EMS in the country, and the rest of it is some other delivery model, whether that be private or hospital or third service, um, all volunteer or all paid. Uh, 
the private ambulance services have struggled as they haven't had access to the assistance of firefighters grants or the other, um, you know, other funding streams that have been made available to governmental agencies. Um, certain volunteer agencies across the country have been unable to bear the burden of the additional response, unable to procure PPE necessary to provide for their employees. And so they have actually shut their doors and stopped responding to calls. Uh, and so, you know, the system is extremely fragile. Um, and just, if I could just piggyback really quickly on the question you asked Dr. Hanfling, I think an important consideration in, in the development of uh, tiered hospital systems is the patient movement between those facilities. This is a battle that we had to address uh, locally. Uh, it's one that we address frequently. The pool of ambulances that are talked about and, and required in order to accomplish those movements are the same ambulances that are stressed or running the calls in the systems, uh, running the calls in to address the, uh, the primary response to COVID from the 911 system um, are then asked to do that. And eventually you'll, you'll double count ambulances to the point where you're unable to enact your plan. And that is a, a situation that we've dealt with here uh, uh, and is also in consideration of the federal ambulance contracts. You know, those also are the same ambulances that are running 911 calls somewhere else in the, in the country. And so it is a very fragile point of protecting your supply of ambulance services in order to enact those tiered hospital plans. So I, I appreciate the question directed to me and I appreciate the opportunity to, to piggyback on the question that Dr. Hanfling answered. Thank you. And quickly, uh, Mr. Moskowitz, I'm not going to ask you a question, but I just want to make a comment. The, the fact that you said that the single most important thing that could, that could happen to change uh, the, the game would be for the President of the United States to wear a mask, and that that would do more to minimize the carnage from this pandemic, um, says by implication that the single thing that has probably uh, maximize the carnage from this pandemic is the president's failure to wear that mask. And I know that's been said over and over again, but lives are still on the line every single day until that message gets to the United States president. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, obviously we all know the president, uh, that position, how much power it holds. Uh, but this pandemic, I think in different ways is actually showing us, uh, what, how much power it actually holds in how people will behave and what they will do and what they will believe. Uh, we live in different times now uh, than, than maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, and, and because things are so divided on all issues, um, you know, disasters and emergency management used to be that one thing that we didn't divide on. Uh, and that's not the case anymore. Um, I do want to, to, to say something on your, your previous question to the doctor, because it is, it is, a, it is something good, and it actually goes back to what the doctor said about the federal government uh, and, and local governments on, on Senator Daschle's question. So, like, were the federal government creating these reserves, these PPE reserves? The reason why the federal government would be better to do that, to create the federal supply cash, is let me tell you what happens at the state government. So I have a, I've created a cash now in real time, Right. So whether it's masks or gloves or gowns or ventilators, all of these things, these are now all in my warehouse. And, as, and Governor Ridge will know this. Uh, well, at some point in time, uh, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, all of those supplies are going to age out. They expire. And you know what's going to happen in the state legislature when we're four or five or six years away from this disaster? They're going to forget and they're not gonna replace the supply because it's not a priority of the moment. And different states will make those decisions. You know, maybe New York says, we're gonna replace our supply, but Texas doesn't, oh, or West Virginia doesn't have the money to do it. And so uh, it's all these states are building the supply, but the further we get away from the next disaster, that cash of supplies is gonna disappear. It's only the federal government who has the spending power and the contracting mechanisms, they're the ones who will continue to replenish and continue to replenish. And so I wanted to point that out because it's something that it goes to your question and, and Senator Daschle's question and that the doctor uh, talked about is, you know, what can the federal government do? That has to be a federal function, although uh, because you'll find five or six years away from this disaster, the supplies that have been built by the states are all gone because the legislatures haven't replaced them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Red. Uh, Ken? 
Thanks very much. I think I'm off mute. Um, great panel, um, great input. I want to circle back to, uh, to uh, Chief Mitchell. You spoke about um, you know federal EMS and sort of where it is and Department of Transportation. And um, I talked to Asha about this. And one of the recommendations in one of our earlier reports was uh, to consider moving that over to HHS. And um, and one of the concerns, I know Bob Cadillac and others have voiced this concern that at Department of Transportation, EMS really doesn't have an advocate, advocate for budget, for attention, et cetera. Uh, and then maybe it sort of falls through the cracks between transportation and HHS. You wanna give us you know, your perspective of sort of how you, if you were to, to work with a blank slate, where you would like to see EMS and what the advantages of maybe a reconfigured organization in the federal system? Certainly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I, I, first off, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, thank the um, uh, dedicated folks that are working in the office of EMS under NHTSA. Is they've done their very best to provide us uh, an information flow um, from the various federal agencies that have a stake in EMS and um, those that develop guidance for us. You know, we meet weekly and and uh, and they've been they've they've done as well as they can absolutely do, and I, I I hope that they all continue to be advocates for EMS in the future. With that said, EMS um, is has always been in in the line between public safety and public health and healthcare. Um, it is very difficult to say would we be better fit in the Department of Homeland Security or in the Health and Human Services Department of the United States government. Personally, I believe HHS is the place to be. 90% uh, of what we're doing uh, in the fire service at this point is healthcare based. Um, everything we're doing in regards to EMS is healthcare based. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where we need to be. It's the source of our primary reimbursement through CMS. Um, we need a seat at that table to advocate for the things that will make our agencies more resilient. And um, reimbursement based funding models, like I spoke about, are antiquated. Uh, the amount of money allocated to the NITS office of EMS represents what the federal government thought that EMS should be able to accomplish 50 years ago. And now we're being called on to do so much more. Uh, we do social work, we do mental health work, we do behavioral health work, we do interfacility transports, we do the decompression of hospitals to make room for um, the tiered system to actually be effective. You know, we are an integral part of public safety and in my opinion, um, one that would benefit greatly from having the congressionally allocated amount of money that it would take to really drive capability assessment and development across this country. Um, if we want to become better at uh, responding to this type of an incident, then we need to make it possible for agencies to, regardless of um, delivery model, you know, not all EMS agencies are governmental based, and that's kind of one of the arguments about why it shouldn't fall to the USFA. Uh, to run EMS is that it doesn't account for 60% of how EMS is delivered in the country. If we want to do a better job of, of supporting EMS agency and having some consistency and ability to respond to things across the country, it's an absolute must that it has to be its own organization within a major department of the United States government and funded appropriately. Okay, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone's patience, but such been a provocative uh, panel. I want to give ex officio members an opportunity to uh, ask questions. Director Moskowitz, I was very impressed with your presentation, and I have written about this issue in some of my books about the politicization of disaster response. I think it's very worrisome. I don't think it started in this administration, although it's been exacerbated currently. It was a problem in the Obama administration when you had people saying they weren't going to take the H1N1 vaccine because they were afraid it was coming from the Obama Department of Homeland Security. So this is an ongoing problem. It is indeed very worrisome. What are your recommendations for addressing this challenge in the future? We might have a new president in November. How do we establish a reset so we don't have to face this in the future? Uh, so, that, so that's a good question. So, you know, it's, it's a problem that, you know, doesn't have one solution. I mean, so let's talk about government, because at the end of the day, uh, I can't control uh, how the media has changed over the last 10 years to now, uh, and how the media model, the corporate media model, uh, is about, you know, feeding division uh, to feed, uh, you know, their viewer. 
Uh, I mean, if you watched an hour of Fox, an hour in CNN, and an hour of MSNBC covering this pandemic, you are going to get three different views on what is happening in real time. Uh, and so that is a problem that I don't necessarily have a solution to. But there has to, there, you know, there, there used to be, and, and I'm preaching to the choir, there used to be, no matter what was happening in the world, the senators and congressmen, this bipartisan nature on things, right? You know, Senator Kennedy and Orrin Hatch could scream at each other on the Senate floor and then go have dinner. Uh, and, and so w when all of a sudden we start seeing each other, not as Americans, but as the enemy internally and seeing each other as the other side, um, you know, that bipartisanship uh, is difficult to have. And so truthfully, uh, you know, what we need is we need those Republican and Democratic senators, those Republican and Democratic House members, uh, you know, whether that's a bipartisan committee uh, or, or some other aspect, there, there has to be somebody calling balls and strikes, right? I, I, I hate to say this, it's like the way politics is right now is there's two teams and there's no umpire, there's no referee, uh, there's no there's nobody who says this is true, that is not true, whether Democrats are saying it or Republicans are saying it. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know that there might not, if there's necessarily a, just a government solution to this. This is a societal, systemic problem. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I, I, not to cut you off, Jared, but no, no, you please. Know, I think the answer is simple. We need, we need political leaders to embrace science. And we need to have science advisors who are visible to us. I think back in my youth, you know, as I was starting, starting my career, going to medical school and so on, you know, C. Everett Koop, his voice and his imposing presence scared the heck out of me. And you know what? I never smoked a cigarette. And, you know, his legacy is uh, standing today because we have turned the, we turned the corner on recognizing how dangerous tobacco use was uh, for the American public. I think, and I wrote a piece uh, with a colleague during the Ebola crisis, we have, and, and I agree completely with everything that Jared said, we have to stop politicizing these issues. And the only way we do that is we allow science to speak and we, we, and we advocate for political leaders who respect their scientific advisors and allow their messages to come through loud and clear. Yeah, and doctor, I, I agree with that. Uh, I, I, there, but there is, if this disaster had happened 10 or 15 years ago, I, I think the response that you'd be seeing in Congress would, even with a president who might be trying to politicize it, I, I just think you'd see a different response in Congress that wouldn't let the president get away with it. And, and, and so what has happened and this could be a whole nother panel, whether it's because of gerrymandering or all of these other things that have gone on. When there is nobody, when there's only one Mitt Romney and there aren't 10 Mitt Romneys, right? Uh, and there's nobody in the house that's doing that. When there's nobody who can say, well, hold on a second, that's not true. Or hold on a second, that's not right. When those people are gone uh, and we have, and we just have two teams, um, listen, We'll, we'll get better potentially when, uh, you know, if you have a president that doesn't want to politicize a disaster, but there'll be somebody else who does it, right? That they'll be the next Donald Trump, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. We're getting more partisan, more partisan, more partisan, more partisan. People can't even be friends anymore with the other side. It's a real problem. And I'm not trying to be hysterical about it, uh, but science it, it, even science right now is being politicized. If you go online, how many articles and how many people are talking about how masks, you can breathe in your own carbon dioxide, okay, and masks are a problem. That's garbage, uh, but it's pervasive and it's being believed by a segment of society because there is no body who says that's not true, that's believed by everybody. Well, I must say that uh, this has been one of the most interesting, provocative, 
uh, panelists. And frankly, I think we could spend the next couple of hours because you were so candid and passionate in your responses. I think one of our colleagues said it earlier, and it might have been Ken, when he said, one of the reasons we are so committed to this enterprise is that we've had men and women such as yourselves who have appeared before us and given us the benefit of their insight, their perspective, and their experience for the past six years to identify how vulnerable we are and how much more we need to do, not to eliminate the risk, but to reduce it substantially. We'll never eliminate the risk from other nature, never eliminate the risk from the nation, state, or terrorist, but we can certainly do things to mitigate it. And so I would just want to thank you for your passionate uh, and your engaged uh, participation in this panel today. And uh, I suspect there may be some even follow-up questions to you on a more personal basis from the panel. And we thank you very much for your contribution. It's very significant. And good luck in Florida. God bless. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, that was a great panel. I agree with, uh, with Tom completely. And uh, you're on a political question, which is so true. It really ultimately falls back to the people and voting into office, people who will not treat uh, uh, emergencies, uh, disasters, as, as another political football. I must say also, uh, we have become so divided politically that the very helpful conversation, really surprisingly candid that we had about the impact of one person, the president, uh, on not wearing a mask or urging everybody to do that. We always have known that the leaders have a, a big effect on what happens in a society, but today, the president is the leader of a party. He becomes the head of one of two major tribes in our country. And what he does, all the members, or a lot of the members of his tribe, feel like they should do. And uh, that can be very harmful. This uh, next panel is, uh, the topic is COVID-19 resurgence, resurgence and compoundment. So on the last panel, Dr. Hentling said years ago when he was asked to speak to Congress about interoperability, he had to go and ask somebody or look up what was interoperability. On the question of compoundment, I had to go to my biodefense dictionary, Dr. Asha George, and she told me that I didn't know whether it was impoundment, like you impound certain items or compound, like compounding interest. Closer to that. Compoundment in this case refers to a situation in which multiple events occur, one on top of the other. In other words, we're talking about the possibility of the continuance of COVID-19 or a second way of occurring at the same time as a particularly bad strain of uh, seasonal influenza or at the, at the same time as a hurricane uh, making landfall. So that's, uh, for the record, what compoundment is. This is another great panel. I'm going to go right to it. Uh, and uh, um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Dr. Mark Lipsich is the director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and professor of epidemiology uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Lipsich, thanks very much for giving us your time. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, resurgence, and I'll say a few words at the end about the compoundment. Okay, good. Um, I think we're not just watching history, and I'm going to focus mainly on the United States uh, with a few words about the rest of the world. I think at the moment we're not just watching history repeat itself as Texas, Arizona, and Florida are on the verge of repeating the crisis that struck New York and Louisiana and a few other places but we're also really losing the opportunity uh, based on the gains that were made in some places uh, in controlling the epidemic as case numbers resurge with reopening. So that I think in the fall, we will be in an incredibly difficult position for reopening schools, despite the extreme need to do so. Um, the, the way in which we're retreating from reopening in some places is perhaps smarter in certain ways focusing on some of the lessons we've learned in the first half year, but it's also much less intense than the initial shelter in place orders, which in many states of the US never brought uh, case numbers under control. 
Um, and I think that's, that's very disturbing because other than the weather, which may be favorable for a few more months and may reduce transmission marginally, nothing important has changed about the conditions for transmission. So if we impose measures less strict than those that didn't work the first time, we can only expect continuing growth of cases, this time from a higher baseline. Um, there are some exceptions to this, of course, in the Northeast mainly. Uh, Governor Cuomo has warned of a second wave of in, uh, in New York, but of course, if this occurs, it will be from a lower and better controlled baseline and with some systems in place uh, to help, uh, help stem the resurgence. Uh, those include better management of cases and contact tracing, uh, a measure that I think is uh, probably of marginal benefit at the moment, but could be made better. Uh, in places that have other have the other epidemic otherwise under control. And I'm happy to talk about that in the discussion. This is a choice, and I think that's important to note. Most of East Asia and Europe have made a very different choice. Intense lockdown, bringing case numbers crucially to a point uh, un, unknown in the United States uh, in recent months of less than one in 100,000 cases per day. Um, and then gradual reopening with a testing infrastructure in place and contact tracing. They undoubtedly experienced more short-term pain in the spring and early summer, but they're positioned to have options while we have many fewer. A couple of months ago, I participated in a call uh, convened by the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada with public health experts from around the world. And the best word I can use to describe that is, is that it was poignant as country after country described first their travails with the virus, which is no easy uh, enemy, and then the well-coordinated uh, multiple levels of efforts across sectors and across levels of government to get the problem under control. This is the sort of leadership we expect in the U.S. but uh, and, and have had in previous pandemics like 2009, but it's not forthcoming largely because those who could offer it, the U.S. Public Health Service, including the CDC, NIH, and FDA, have been largely silenced or politicized. Um, I think these failures can be traced to a lack of strategy and leadership from the federal level, meaning that even well-intentioned governors were competing with each other for scarce PPE and ventilators, were confused about how to use the limiting test limited testing available, and in some cases themselves, uh, the less perhaps well-intentioned governors repeated the unrealistic assessments coming down from the political leadership of the country, which has frozen out and continues to freeze out the voices of public health and science. Pandemic is also demonstrating in a once in a century way how the inequities and disparities we've tolerated uh, in housing, education, physical structures, health status, access to affordable care, and other dimensions of well being translate directly to pandemic unpreparedness in the form of higher death rates uh, among those born without the privileges of money and skin color and among the elderly. Across the world, the picture is mixed, as you know, with large parts of the globe at the moment under control using significant resources and a concerted national strategy. And much of Latin America, India, and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, others having a much harder time. So what can we do about this? I think it's very clear that even now we need to build a national strategy. There's an awful lot of really thoughtful uh, and useful activity in academia and the foundation world and, and elsewhere to try to do this, for, but no coordination. For example, there are a number of bold proposals, those from the Romer brothers, Paul and Roy, for massive testing to reopen schools, um, and one from uh, some colleagues to, for very uh, cheap, low sensitivity, but high frequency testing uh, for everyone. Um, and the problem is that there's nobody home to implement these strategies or figure out the problems with them and fix them and make something happen. It's all just a bunch of good ideas that are not going anywhere because of lack of leadership. I'm not sure I agree with my colleagues who were interviewed in this morning's paper. I can't remember if it was the Post or the Stat News, uh, who say we can't have full lockdown uh, again. Um, I think we can be smarter and not confine people inside and do some of the things that clearly were overreactions. But as I said before, I'm concerned that the measures in the spring were inadequate to bring case numbers down, and I'm unconvinced that a weaker, even a smarter version will do better. Um, 
This is particularly true because as our group and others have shown, the peak demand for intensive care, which is perhaps the, the key point of the system, can lag the imposition of control measures by more than a month. We cannot wait for a crisis to impose restrictions, uh, which seems to be what uh, a number of states are doing right now. But then we need serious efforts to use other tools, economic incentives to avoid sick people coming to work, primary care interventions to help people who are vulnerable and avoid infection, scour the world to figure out the best ways to insulate nursing homes uh, and then make the investments to support implementing those and so on. I don't know how to get here, there from here, but I'll end where I began. This virus has caused a lot of destruction, but it has not yet infected most of the people in the country. If we continue with limited measures, we're going to have exponential growth for a long time and to much higher levels. This is just the simple math of epidemics. And as much as we uh, can not be happy about this, I think we've had a lot of magical thinking to date uh, and we need, and this is really the realistic alternative. Uh, so I'll end there. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Doctor. That was uh, that was really on point. I appreciate it a lot. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. Next is Dr. Tracy Goldstein, Associate Director of the One Health Institute and Co-Principal Investigator at the PREDICT Project at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Goldstein, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to take us back in the, in the chain of events sort of before this outbreak occurred and what we've been doing for the last 10 years to understand what viruses circulate in animals and where the risk might be. Um, so under the PREDICT project, um, the USAID Emerging Threats Program has been building capacity to perform surveillance in animals and people to detect viruses in high-risk places where people and animals are in contact in 30 countries since 2009. And of course, <clears throat> during this outbreak, there's been a lot of discussion about the virus, if and how it came from animals. And of course, the virus itself must have the ability to infect humans. That's the critical first step that it needs to have. But alone, that's not sufficient for spillover. Um, the timing of shedding, what animals it's in, and the human contact um, with the animal at the right time is obviously needed for all of these things to occur. So these critical elements must all align for spillover to occur and an understanding of that is needed so we can see what we can do to prevent that in the future. I think the pandemic also highlighted that the links um, between how changes in the environment affects animals and that of course affects human health. And so we really do need this One Health approach to be able to understand these complex problems. And so the PREDICT project has been co performing um, coordinated One Health surveillance of people, their animals and wildlife in communities. So back where contacts occurring to try to understand the known and unknown viruses that are circulating and to see where and what the risks are. Um, in the lab, we use broadly reactive assays. So these can detect known viruses and also relatives of um, these known viruses that are still unknown. Um, in priority families, such as coronaviruses, filoviruses that carry Ebola and Marburg, et cetera. And so these additional tools are really useful in our toolbox for when our other tests don't work, when something new emerges or a virus changes and old tests don't work. So for the last 10 years, um, we've been testing samples from almost 90,000 people, domestic animals, bats, rodents, and primates. And of course, since the emergence of SARS-1 in 2002 and MERS in 2012, it's become clear that coronaviruses are a family of concern and their links to animals, especially bats, um, needs to be better studied. So as a part of our work, we wanted to better understand what and what, where and what animals the highest risk is for exposure and especially address gaps in these resource limited countries where viruses seem to be emerging. So of the 90,000 people and animals we tested, the majority, 70% of the positives were in bats, and 85% of the viruses we found were also in bats. Um, what we found was where there, were more where there were more bats, we found more viruses, and where there were more types of bats, we found more types of coronaviruses. We also found that some bat families were more likely to carry certain types. So for example, when we're talking about the SARS-related ones, so SARS-1 and the one that causes COVID-19, we found that these were linked to two bat families, um, two types of insect-eating bats. And this is important, first in the context of this pandemic, because this helps to guide how to look for the reservoir. We need to know where to start. We need to know where related viruses have been found in the past. And then second, this can help us to understand where risks in the future might come from. 
And one way to look at that is to map where these positive fats are found, sort of where their geographic range was, and look for where there's hotspots. And not surprisingly, we did find hotspots in Asia, but really also in other places in Africa. So this really stresses the importance that understanding these viruses, we need to look at that in the context of where the animals are found, not just where the viruses have been found in the past. I'm going to sort of step over to some other important viruses that we found in, in West Africa. So after the Ebola virus outbreak, we were there working to try to understand a little bit more about Ebola virus ecology. And during our work, we found a new Ebola virus and also Margaret virus in Sierra Leone. So the new Ebola virus called Bombali virus was found in bats in and around people's homes. And so because of it being in and around people's homes, it's really important to understand, does it have the ability to infect humans? And so to do this, we looked at this experimentally to see if it could use the receptor that um, other Ebola viruses use, how easily it can enter and infect human cells, if it can prevent the immune system from fighting um, the virus, something that Ebola is very good at, and also if it can infect different types of human and animal cells, because all of these factors are really important for us to understand which of these new viruses to worry about in the future. And in fact, we were able to show that Bombali can infect humans, but not as well as Ebola does. We were also able to find the changes in the virus that would make it look more like Ebola. So that's really important to understand what makes a virus become a pathogen. And, and perhaps if we can test enough of those, we can find patterns that emerge that will allow us to predict which ones have the potential to be pathogens and which ones don't. The other important aspect of identifying and sequencing these new viruses is they can and should be included in pipelines to develop broader acting therapeutics and vaccines. Now to do this, we need better links with NIH and the private sector. And of course, there's no guarantee that this will work, but these broader therapeutics or vaccines might give us additional tools that we can use when viruses emerge rather than trying to develop them in the middle of an outbreak. And then finally, finding something like Marburg virus in Sierra Leone is important for a number of reasons. Marburg is a relative to Ebola. It causes similar diseases in people and has, co uh, has um, caused outbreaks in, in other places in East Africa. So Sierra Leone is the furthest west, more than 2,400 kilometers away that this virus was found. Um, we found it in the same bats where it's been found in other places of the world. So again, another important reminder that these viruses are found where the animals live, not just where we've seen them previously in people. So if we can better understand that, we can have a more proactive approach to preventing spillover rather than just chasing what happened in the past. And then the other important piece is the need to work with communities, governments, and public health to be able to be thinking more broadly about what might be causing diseases in their regions, expand the list of viruses when investigating disease, and then of course make sure labs have the tools to detect these new and emerging threats um, sooner rather than later. I think we're going to continue to find new animals, um, new viruses and animals, and viruses will continue to mutate and change. And we need to understand this and, and how this occurs. Bats do carry infectious pathogens, but they're also important for eating insects and being pollinators. So it's important to remember that we need them for our crops and for our health as well. Really, human behavior is a big thing that's changing. Our behavior is driving land use change, deforestation, climate change. And our behavior is bringing us into contact with new animals in new ways. So understanding what viruses are in animals, what factors affect timing of viral shading and how and when people are coming in contact with them will help us to find ways to decrease contact and hopefully prevent spillover. So I'm going to stop there. I think there'll be some questions around some of that, but I'm going to stop there and hand it over to um, the next speaker. Uh, thanks, Dr. Goldstein. <clears throat> that was great. There'll be a lot of questions. One of the things that all of us on the commission have learned over our almost six years now working together is the, uh, the zoonotic effect, the interaction of animals uh, people that so affects our health. So you, you're a really expert on that, and I look forward to questioning. Uh, final on this panel, Dr. Cornelius Clancy, Chief of the Infectious Disease Section, VA Pittsburgh Health System, and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Clancy, there's a, a really dangerous, disproportionate influence of the state of Pennsylvania on this commission. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, brothers Ridge and Greenwood, <laughs> very, very demanding. It's that so, knock on Jim Greenwood. <laughs> right. So you're welcome. You're among friends. 
We see, uh, we see a lot of ridges in Western Pennsylvania, I'll say that. Um, although none have claimed relationship, I always ask them. Um, so I, I'm known to the government as Cornelius Clancy and professionally, uh, I go by Neil. And I'm both a clinician, infectious diseases specialist, uh, and an infectious diseases research. And among my research interests are uh, antimicrobial resistance among bacteria and among fungi. And I'll talk a bit about the compoundment or potential compoundment of COVID-19 and antimicrobial resistance. By antimicrobial resistance, I'm referring specifically to uh, bacterial and fungal resistance. And um, you know, what we've known for a number of years, and really this was work that Dr. Fauci did in autopsies of influenza patients, is that serious viral infections like influenza are often complicated by secondary or co-infections with bacteria and to a lesser extent fungi. And in fact, the leading cause of death among patients with severe influenza in the United States and globally are secondary infections. And this is true for uh, respiratory viruses in general. And we're beginning to get a handle on how uh, uh, big an issue secondary infections are with COVID-19. And what the emerging consensus is that among hospitalized patients globally uh, with COVID-19, the rate of secondary infections across hospitals has probably been on the order of about uh, 10%. However, if you look at the more critically ill patients and patients in particular who are intensive care units and maybe getting things like hemodialysis or ventilatory support with a breathing machine, uh, the rates of secondary infection have been on the order of 30 to 40% in, in intensive care units. If you look at the autopsy data of people who have died in hospital with COVID, the numbers would suggest about 25 to 35% of those patients have histopathologic findings, particularly within the lungs that are consistent with secondary bacterial pneumonias. And there are even emerging data now in the community that people dying in the community with COVID have histopathologic evidence of bacterial pneumonias as well at about 30%. So we don't know the precise numbers, but I think it's fair to say that a significant minority of hospitalized patients with COVID will develop a secondary infection, and those percentages um, will be higher among the most critically ill and those patients in intensive care units. We also know, because of the nonspecific nature by which COVID patients present to the hospital with things like fever and respiratory uh, uh, symptoms and abnormalities on chest x-rays, that antibiotic use actually exceeds the secondary infection use. So again, data from throughout the world and the data from the United States are consistent with this, which suggests 60 to 80% of all hospitalized patients with COVID are going to get uh, an antibacterial and or an antifungal at some point during their hospitalization. And again, among the intensive care unit population, that's going to be 80% and above. And I think the evolving practice has been among clinicians, given the severity of illness for people who are in hospital, the degree to which they can quickly decompensate, the difficulty in conclusively excluding a bacteria or fungal infection, clinicians are gonna err on the side of giving an antibiotic or an antifungal agent in the most severely ill COVID patients, at least until they get things sorted out. So this presents a real stewardship challenge and it presents a challenge in terms of stewardship programs, integrating testing and test results that might help them determine what are the sizable minority of patients who we are going to have to treat with antibiotics and antifungals, particularly in the hospital? Can we get drugs to them efficiently, quickly, at the same time limit unnecessary and excess drug ex uh, exposure that may fuel antimicrobial resistance and excess use? What we've seen to this point is that the microbiology and resistance patterns globally have largely reflected what's going on in local hospitals and local units. So if you've got a pre-existing problem with antimicrobial resistance in your hospital, if you've got nasty bugs that are common in your hospital, things like MRSA, VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, or the resistant gram negative superbugs that you've heard a lot about, the so-called CREs, pseudomonas, these are the pathogens that you're gonna see among your COVID patients. They're gonna pick up the bugs that are already in your local communities and in your local hospitals. And I think this is particularly important because if you look at the places globally in the United States that were hit really hardest as part of the first wave epicenters, 
there are places where antimicrobial resistance is a major pre-existing problem. So we're talking about China and many places in Asia. We're talking about Italy, Spain, and Europe. And in the United States, the New York, New Jersey area, the Northeast in general, and even now in places like Houston and South Florida, where uh, you've got uh, cosmopolitan populations and you've got pre-existing resistance mechanisms in the community. Um, so the, the epicenters have been places where uh, antimicrobial resistance has been pre-existing and has been a problem. So I think for those of us in the field right now, some of the most immediate pressing questions are, what's going to happen with antimicrobial resistance moving forward? Are we going to see not only the emergence of pre-existing bugs and resistance mechanisms, but are we going to see the emergence of new resistance mechanisms? And they will, will they be part of what comes to play over the next uh, year to two? Um, what is going to be the impact of evolving COVID treatment on secondary infections, antibiotic use, and antimicrobial resistance? So recent data have shown, for example, that corticosteroids have mortality benefit. Well, these are major immunosuppressants. Even short course corticosteroid treatment is associated with increased risk of bacterial and fungal infections. There are a number of evolving treatments that are out there that manipulate different arms of the immune system. And as COVID unfolds, this may impact what we see with resistance and secondary infection. The mere fact that we're doing a better job at keeping patients alive longer also means their ongoing risk for secondary infections, particularly if they're gonna be in the intensive care units. Uh, so our improvements in some ways increase the likelihood that we'll be dealing with antimicrobial resistance. The major question for all of us in the field is what's gonna happen over the weeks and months ahead. We're gonna get into the fall and winter. We're gonna get into influenza season. Are we gonna see compoundment? We always see an uptick in antibiotic use and the emergence of resistant pathogens, particularly in ICUs during influenza season. Uh, the patients who do badly with influenza are the ones who are most at risk for bad outcomes with COVID. The elderly, particularly nursing home patients and people with pre-existing diseases like diabetes or immunosuppression. A big question is, we know in hospitals, antibiotic use is really shut up with COVID in hospitals that are dealing with the disease. Actually, nationally, if you look, though, because of decreased access of healthcare services, overall antibiotic use, both in hospital and the community, has been down about 40%. So major questions are, is the localized increase in hospitals and in units taking care of patients uh, with COVID going to be the major driver of what we see with antimicrobial resistance? even if overall antibiotic use has been down. And what's gonna happen in the months ahead, particularly as we get into influenza season, are we gonna see a, a rebound in antibiotic use and inappropriate antibiotic use? And what will the imp impact of that be on resistance potentially? A big question is what's going to happen with stewardship programs as healthcare systems has faced financial difficulties as a, as a result of COVID. It's always tough in pharmacy to keep the funding, keep the staffing going to enact uh, responsible and, and robust stewardship? And are the financial pressures going to cause healthcare systems to cut back on the ancillary support that we need to do good stewardship in hospitals? So what do those of us in, in I think, the profession and, and, and uh, the policy community need to do most immediately? I think for those of us working on the front lines, we need to track our data, we need to report our data, we need to identify trends as they emerge and change, and we need to adapt and we need to communicate with one another uh, Dr. Lipstitch talked about learning the same lessons and a lot of what they're going through now in Houston had already been gone through in New York. And this is something within the profession we have to share and communicate with one another. And then finally, I'll say, all this is happening in the background of really a crisis in antibiotic development. And despite the emergence, there are 3 million people in the United States infected every year with a highly resistant pathogen. The CDC just put that data out in the past year. But yet companies developing new antibiotics are failing left, right, and center. A third of the companies that have had an FDA-approved agent in the antimicrobial space uh, are no longer in the business over the past 10 years. We've had five failures of small biotechs who've brought new FDA-approved agents to market in the past two years. So this is an ongoing crisis. It predates COVID. COVID is perhaps going to exacerbate it, but it'll be here long after COVID has gone. And the way I look at this, if you look at pandemic viruses and COVID's the worst we've faced in a century, they're the hair. They race out and then they garner a lot of tension. But the way to think of antimicrobial resistance is more like the tortoise. tortoise. I mean, it's just going to plot along inexorably. Different pandemics will come and go. And in 10 years, we'll have more antimicrobial resistance than we have now. 
And projections by 2050 is that 10 million people globally will die of antimicrobial resistant infections. So if we don't keep in front of it, if we don't fix the broken antimicrobial marketplace where we have a small window to do so now, in five, 10 years, we'll pay a bigger price and have more difficulty doing so. And with that, I'll turn it back to the uh, commission and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Clancy. That was what my buddy John McCain would call straight talk. And I think <laughs> if, my if my mother were still alive and she heard you, her answer would have been the uh, expletive, oi. I'm <laughs> <laughs> from New Jersey. I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Lipsitz, on the last panel, we asked them what's the one thing they would do to in the short run to make things better. And I, I wanted to clarify that I heard you say what's really most important now is a full lockdown in uh, parts of the country that have not gone into it yet. Am I hearing you right or would you expand uh, in answer to that question? I think uh, because it's such an unpopular view, I will temper it a little bit and just say, I think um, that the, you know, Closing bars and gyms is nice, but that is not enough. Um, and it seems like the the sense is that we can do a lot less this time than what didn't work last time, and that's faulty reasoning. So I think we need to think through the we need to think through the individual pieces of a lockdown and find ways to mitigate it. But I don't think that kind of going tiptoeing back from from the reopening that we've had is the right level of uh, alarm. It should be two or three levels more taken more seriously than that. Okay, that's important. And obviously that goes to leadership, perhaps at first at the state levels, which is happening somewhat now, and hopefully more consistent leadership from the federal level. Uh, Tom Rich, I'm going to send it over to you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Senator. I'm, I'm really interested in perspective. One question to all three, at least initially, what is your sense of the collaboration among individual scientists such as yourself with others so that the broader community working collectively to help us do this, or, do you, or is everybody still operating in a silo? I guess I can start and then maybe the others want to top up. I think um, in this particular outbreak, the communication among scientists has been better than ever before. Um, and, and people sharing data and and not worrying about the usual, well, I need to publish it before I share it. Um, and so I think that there's been a lot more communication. People are putting up preprints. Um, before publication and also early on in the outbreak sharing sequences that were really really important in order to develop um, diagnostic assays um, so I do feel like the silos are have broken down somewhat in 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 this I still think um, where they are still um, silos are, is sort of communicating across sectors you know from the environment to animal to to human you know at this point the virus very very quickly changed and became a human problem so it makes sense that that is where the most um uh focus is but if we continue to do that we're always going to be chasing the past so i do think we need to figure out ways to keep these silos um open in the future i appreciate that you should know that this commission has has said we need one help it needs to be animal environment and in, in, in human. So I appreciate that notion. Let me ask you, uh, uh, if I could, uh, Dr. Clancy, the, this, this antibiotic uh, uh, development, I, uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that um, because Mother Nature's moves, she's just far more complicated than we are. I just, I'm intrigued by the concern that you've expressed and I don't bore you with personal reasons. What do we need to do to accelerate research and develop in this space? Because it seems like it's getting ahead of us. I mean, it seems like we're losing ground in Mother Nature. And so what are the incentives we need in the process in order to catch up? We'll never surpass her, but I'd like to catch up with her. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the problem right now is, is, is really on the back end, and it's really sort of a market problem. As you know, for the past two decades, there have been a number of public and private efforts to spur uh, antibiotic development. They've actually done a, a, a great job. Um, you know, just over the past five years, for example, we've had 50, 
15 new antibiotics get FDA approval. Uh, what's happening now in the pipeline is that the interest in getting in has really dissipated. And the reason for that is everyone coming out from the other side, and these are the successes, the people who are making drugs that get FDA approval, uh, that's where the market is failing. And with that now, we're seeing the effect where the investment people would really rather go into the you know, uh, neurologic, the immunosuppressive space than go into the antibiotic space if they're going to fail. So to me, um, the solution has to be on the back end and has to be on the, uh, on the market end. And there's a couple different ways you can go. And within the field, we've had a number of these discussions. On the one hand, there are people who say, let's just go to a nonprofit model. This is what they're doing in tuberculosis and malaria. And if you can't make money, let's just recognize it and go non-commercially with it. I think the larger bar body of people would like to fix the marketplace so we can leverage what the market does, but make it such that antibiotics can produce a product that will, that will realize some return on investment. And there are several problems that antibiotics face. You wanna limit use to those cases where you absolutely have to use the new antibiotics, which means that it's gonna be a subset of the pie. The older antibiotics, when they work, are cheaper, and they're the ones that should be used. Uh, so you've got this sort of built-in dis disincentive, which is kind of unique among, among medicines. So I think we have to get to a model that in some way delinks the individual use of an antibiotic, individual prescriptions from reimbursement. Um, and whether that's some sort of subscription model, which is currently being bandied about with the Pasteur Bill in Congress, uh, these have you know, been rolled out now on a pilot base in the UK or something like that. But in antibiotics, if on the one hand we have stewardship, we want to use drugs res responsibly and restrict use, then a reimbursement that's based on the number of pills you get just isn't going to work. Thank you. Thank you. One final question, if you don't mind, Senator Lero, I need to ask. All three could answer it if you want to, but I'm curious, uh, Dr. Lipsic, you were old enough to talk about a shutdown, and I appreciate your point of view. There are many risks associated, as I read, with this, this, this isolation, this shutdown. And I'm really thinking of the children and their education. Put the economic aside, everything else aside. Is there a way that at least in primary schools, where it's that social interaction, it's the brain development. I mean, there's so many things that go on at an early stage in a child's life that in isolation for six months, a year, two years, who knows, it could, could limit, retard that, that growth. Can you envision a, an environment, at least in a primary school, under your thesis, of you know really restricting activity, and that's what you basically mean when you said shut down. I don't think, but can you can you envision that? Or and the, everybody could comment on. I just and I'm not I'm not one of those says the kids got to get back to school because they get back to school. There are other risks associated with this isolation, mental health risks, other risks. So can you envision a way we can get some of the young kids back into school? I went by a playground the other day and saw three and four year old kids wearing masks. All right, well they're three and four years old. They'll get used to it. Mother and dad will explain it to them when they get older. But in primary school, could you help me with that? If yeah. you have an opinion. Yes, I, I very much do. And, and I just also like to say I would have given the same answers as my colleagues to the previous two questions. Good, thank um, you. Except to say that the, the uh, issue of collaboration, I think all of what Tracy said is true. What I found as a personal phenomenon is just that time becomes the limit. It's not goodwill, and it's not, it's not secrecy, it's nothing like that. It's just that all of us are so in our worlds that it's very hard to get the big picture. And the problem is so complex that uh, I find that the biggest challenge. Uh, but, but that's a human problem from goodwill rather than anything else. Um, to answer your question about schools, uh, my wife, who's a professor of education, and I and a clinical colleague have a and our perspective coming out, I hope in the next week or two, making a case for opening primary schools as much as possible. Um, so I am very sympathetic to your view. Um, I think the, the, the biggest dilemma is in places where there is so much community transmission 
that the adult to adult contact in primary schools is uh, is almost certain to cause transmission. I'm actually somewhat comfortable with the notion that children are not not going to be major transmitters of this virus as best we understand it. The evidence is not great, but it is uh, it is that is the direction it goes. Um, so I think if we could find a way to limit adult to adult contact in schools, remembering that many schools are extremely under-resourced and therefore very dense with adults. Uh, and four, you know, four adults in the same room because of special ed and whatever, um, it's not going to be easy. And something might have to happen like not like moving some of the primary schools into the secondary school buildings in order to de-densify them or some other things like that, some really creative approaches. Um, so I think this is this is, you know, so short of food and healthcare uh, and energy services, I think education is another essential function that our society must perform. Um, and that there's a case to be made for having it open the way we have grocery stores and, and medical services open um, for all the reasons you describe and more. Um, I think the, the trick is that uh, schools are not capable of are not designed for social distancing, quite the opposite. So um, I think, you know, the, that would be the last thing I would close uh, almost bef uh, in addition, you know, besides food. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Newman. Uh Thanks, Governor. Uh, Senator Deschel, over to you. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I, I know we're getting really short on time, but I, I have to ask a question around the international implications of all of this. I, uh, all morning we've been understandably and, and necessarily focused on the domestic uh, challenges we face, but there are enormous international challenges. And I worry a great deal about the lack of coordination, uh, our, now our disengagement from the World Health Organization, and the implications that that holds. And could you, could any one of you talk a little bit about how you would judge our current circumstances involving international cooperative efforts and what the lack of leadership and now our disengagement from the World Health Organization can mean to our ultimate success in addressing the challenge going forward, say, in the next year or so? I mean, it seems to me that unless we focus more on the international uh, aspects of this, uh, this is never going to go away. And, uh, and so I'd love to get your thoughts in whatever succinct way you can, you can provide them in the time we have. I think it's been catastrophic. Um, and, uh, you know, the bug doesn't care about borders, uh, nor does antimicrobial resistance care about borders. Uh, and these are all global, global problems. Um, I will say on a professional level, uh, the collaboration, which I agree has been unprecedented within the profession, I think that has extended across borders and, and that's been good. But on a, on a policy level, this idea that you could somehow build a wall is preposterous. And in fact, the wall is being built because we're not allowed to leave the country now because of the risk we pose to us. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, um in a way, it's kicking the WHO when it's down and when it needs most needs help. And I think all of us have our bones to pick with how the WHO, for many of us at least, has operated in this situation. But um, but the need for a WHO and the fact that it's what we have globally and needs to be fixed, not not kicked, uh, is is a real one. And I would say the same goes for the CDC. I mean, the CDC uh, was handicapped by political interference from the beginning. It's now being blamed for what I suspect was, uh, to a large degree, a planned uh, inability of it to to play a leadership role, and um, and just just this by this in the same way we need the CDC and we need the WHO as bulwarks against the next one of these. And we've seen how well they can do in other pandemics and in other situations, never perfectly, but never, but always better than the alternative. Uh, so I think it's a mistake. 
Yeah, I agree. I think on a policy level, um, it's been very um, devastating to watch what's been happening. The one thing I would say is, um, you know, for example, USAID has continued to invest um, in these other countries. So throughout this um, outbreak, we've had extended funding to support our teams in Cambodia, in Cote d'Ivoire, you know, in Tanzania. Um, and so I think those networks um, that have been built through some of the US um, government investments are ways that um, those folks can stay um, linked and help each other. And we're seeing that across borders. Cambodia is helping our colleagues in Thailand with, with tests and, and vice versa, or in Laos, et cetera. So I think that um, investing at those levels is really, really important. And, and that's maybe the way that we can make some differences and, uh, and also sort of check in on, on how things are going in those countries when communication at the higher level, unfortunately, is um, stalling right now. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank, uh, thanks, Tom. I do want to give Jim Greenwood and uh, Ken Winston an opportunity to ask a question each if they'd like. Sure. Actually, I'm, uh, of course, time is short, but I won't ask a question. But I do want to give a little commercial in response to what Dr. Clancy said. Um, and by the way, Dr. Clancy, I'm sorry to hear that there are, while there are so many ridges in your neck of the woods, so few of them actually are willing to, to acknowledge the <laughs> issue. Um, <laughs> oh, it's pretty cold, Greenwood. Pretty cold. <laughs> but seriously, um, you know why it is? Why is it that we don't? We're not developing as many antivirals as we should. It was a company called a, a Coagen or something that, like that, and it came up with a new drug. It was the first drug it ever developed. It was called Zendri. I think it took them 15 years. Uh, it usually costs a billion or two dollar or, or two billion dollars to invent a drug. Uh, you have a 90 percent chance of failing as a biotech company. Uh, so you start there, you have a, you have a, as soon as they got their drug approved, they went out, they went bankrupt because they just couldn't get reimbursed sufficiently for it. And um, there are reasons for that. And, and, and it's largely because this has a high social value, but just low, ridiculously low reimbursement rates. We don't pay for these antivirals, the, anything equivalent to what they're saving us in terms of dollars in the healthcare system and, and in human lives. And that has to change. Um, the, the problem is we have a system of reimbursement, which is called diagnostic related groups. You go into a hospital to get your DRG and you're going to get paid based on what that, that, um, diagnosis is, regardless of whether the, the patient's going to end up with, a, with an infection. And, and then, uh, it, the insurance companies and the hospitals tend because they're going to get paid so much money for each patient, regardless of what they spend on that patient. Um, they don't want to use the new uh, and most expensive uh, antivirals. Uh, so, they, so that's why the market, as you said, the market uh, fails. There, was, there is legislation called the Disarm Act um, that was actually put into the CARES Act in response to COVID that would have increased these incentives. But because of the politics of we don't want to do anything, uh, it looks like we're in any way favoring drug companies, the Democrats stripped it out in the House. Um, so that's where we're going to have to go back and create the incentive, financial incentives for companies that have the, the willingness and the scientific wherewithal to come up with these new antivirals if we can fix the, the market. Yeah, I'll just make a, a, a point that um, it, it's a heavy lift with anything involving pharma. Big pharma have left this business. Yeah. You know, there are 25 agents in the investigational clinical trial pipeline right now. Big Pharma are involved in any capacity in only three of them. So the companies that are failing are the archaeogens of the world. These are entrepreneurial startups. It's not yeah. Pfizer. It's not Merck. I mean, right. they're making cancer and immunosuppressive drugs. So, you know, even if, if Big Pharma are, are Satan itself, that's not what's going on in, 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 in this space. Disarm uh, would carve uh, antimicrobial use against resistant pathogens out of the DRG, uh, which is an important, uh, important aspect of that. I'm a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America, and, and, and we've been on the Hill, you know, advocating for reform, and disarm is something that I think would help. Yeah, and not only that, but we don't take it every day like Lipitor, right? You take it, you know, in the hospital, and then you're done. So it's, right. not, it's not a chronic lead. That was a very important exchange. Thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Lipsitz, Goldstein, and Clancy. You've been really helpful to us. Uh, you're uh, really, you're, you're always important, but at this stage of our history in America, you, people like you are national assets. So 
And of course, bottom line of what we've said earlier in the morning, we and the governor, government needs to listen to you. Uh, we got a lot to think about based on what you said. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. I, I said earlier, we put out a report in 2015 and uh, it was very prescient, unfortunately, not because we are geniuses, but because we, we talk to and listen to experts like you. And um, um, this is where we come back now to ask you to help us uh, with what we can do, uh, what we've learned in the last six months and what we can be advocates for with Congress and the White House um, in the near term, six months to a year and a longer if necessary. So let's start with uh, uh, Mr. Madrigal, co-founder of the COVID tracking project and a staff writer at the Atlantic. And the, and the topic of this panel, as you know, but for those who are tuning in, is disease tracking, which came up a couple of times in our panels this morning as something that was really necessary, but we hadn't quite figured out how to do very well yet. So Mr. Madrigal, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really, it's uh, an honor to be here. And I think we just want to recognize the work of a lot of the people who uh, have been on these issues for, for years, if not decades, um, trying to work out data governance, doing the hard work of public health and um, data collection. And, you know, we're Johnny come lately to this, you know, uh, on March 3rd, the COVID tracking project didn't exist. You know, uh, today, um, our numbers were on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and we've developed some unique strategies for trying to deal with this um, sweet, generous situation that we have encountered here um, with, the, with the pandemic. Um, the project actually grew out of um, two different realms of the, of the world. Uh, on my side, um, the Atlantic and journalism, we ran one of the first stories. Um, highlighting how little testing had been done in the US um, in the month of February. Uh, and we did it just by compiling information um, and interviews with state uh, health departments. And uh, about an hour after we hit publish on that story, um, an old college friend of mine uh, named Jeff Hammerbacher, who'd gone on to create the data structures at Facebook and then went into bioinformatics, sent me an email with a link to a spreadsheet saying, oh, this story is so great. Did you uh, use my spreadsheet? And I said, no, I used my spreadsheet. And I sent him my spreadsheet and we looked at them and we realized that we both had been doing the same thing. Um, that state level information was really the only way to keep tabs on what was happening in anything. It's not actually real time, but at least the least delayed possible way. So we joined forces, brought on another uh, co-founder from the news world named Aaron Kassane, who's run big projects like this for ProPublica and other places. And we began um, day by day tracking uh, the, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, every day since then, we've published these numbers. You know, no weekends, there's no holidays. Every single day, the numbers have to go out. Um, we have hundreds of volunteers now. Um, we've been supported by the Emerson Collective, the Beneficus Foundation, and now Rockefeller uh, and Robert Wood Johnson. And we have paid contributors now to um, about 20 of them who run most of the, the teams. Um, it's an incredibly time intensive process to do what we do. It takes humans, though we do have some automation kind of running in the background. Um, this data is incredibly nuanced, it's incredibly tricky, the data definitions change, um, and absent um, data definitions that are put out by the federal government, the states, even though they're all trying to report the same things, report everything a tiny bit differently. And my favorite example of this is um, most states report age buckets, right? You know, this many people, mostly cumulative data, unfortunately, um, but they report cumulative data of how many people at different age brackets had, um, had gotten sick or died or, or whatever the metric is. But if you look at the way the states do it, some states do it 60 to 70. Some do it 60 plus. Some do it 61 to 70. Some do it 61 to 69. Some do it 64 plus. Some do it 65 plus. And that tiny little problem 
Um, which really every state is doing it the right way. They all have their own buckets. It all makes sense within their state borders. Generates huge problems in trying to do and create national summary statistics that make sense for anyone who doesn't have access to the case line data, um, which you know the New York Times got access to a snapshot of it. People have some other people have access through it through HHS for Tech Now, and but for the public and for states who can't actually you know Maryland person can't go look at Louisiana data. You know, so everybody is sort of struggling with what's publicly available on these state dashboards to understand the national picture and slight variations in the way that states uh, publish and, uh, and track data make our job incredibly difficult. Another great example is states at the beginning of this thing reported hospitalizations in two different ways. Some states reported cumulative hospitalizations, which is a reasonable thing to do. Other states reported current hospitalizations, which is what New York was doing. And because New York had the bulk of, um, of hospitalizations for a time period, um, there were actually more current hospitalizations than there were cumulative hospitalizations in the national numbers because we were, <laughs> we were kind of mixing two different quantities. Through time, almost every state now has standardized on publishing current hospitalizations, and we believe it's actually become the most uh, reliable figure for understanding what's going on. Um, in on a daily basis uh, with this outbreak, but it took an enormous amount of work to, to get to that um, point. Um, another great example, and then uh, I'll try and wrap up shortly, is you know we've partnered with uh, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi's group, which is now at the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research to create the COVID racial data tracker, um, which does basically the same thing that we do for testing and hospitalizations and cases and deaths, that is to say, pulling information from state dashboards. Um, we also do that with uh, racial and um, ethnic data. Um, and there's, again, we run into very similar problems uh, here. Some people basically treat Latinos like myself as a racial group. Other people uh, break out racial groups and then have um, ethnicity as a, as a separate category, the way that the census does it. And that's kind of the key problem. We thought everybody would follow census designations because that allows you to bring all the rest of the federal statistical apparatus to bear on this um, COVID racial data, but we actually have not found that. Um, and that makes, it, makes the analysis um, and the, the usefulness of the incredible work that all these state health departments are doing to get this information, it just reduces its utility for everybody. And so we really have um, struggled with this uh, because we really, the uh, way we are, see our role is a node in an informational network. You know, our data is used on the Johns Hopkins tracker, it's used by the New York Times, it's used by the COVID exit strategy, it's, it's uh, used by state health departments and epidemiologists and modelers to try to make sense of, uh, of what's happening. And um, unfortunately, this virus doesn't respect the political boundaries that we've established, and yet we track information within those political boundaries. And so it's sort of just another sort of fractal piece of this same problem, which is we keep trying to fight this pandemic on a state-by-state -state basis um, when there's, <laughs> there's no underlying biological reality uh, to, to our states. And um, for us, we feel like the meta accountability point um, that we make is that we need a coordinated federal response, not just to the pandemic, but to the underlying data that informs uh, the actions that we take as a nation, as we take as states, as we take as even, you know, all the way down to county health officers. And um, we hope, um, though we now don't have very much hope, but we still hope that one day the CDC will come in and begin providing all the things that we have in with uh, the same way that um, makes this data useful for so many people um, and that we can just go out of business and I can go back to writing stories about um, the technology industry like I used to before. Um, but until that day comes, we'll be there um, as a civil society group filling in um, and, uh, and thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Marjorie. What a story, because you know, you answer every now and then I've asked myself when I'm reading data in the mass media, it's from you 
or Johns Hopkins or University of Washington or somewhere else like that, but never from the from the federal government. And you've explained to me why. So thanks for filling the gap. But really, we should liberate you to be able to go back, <laughs> right? Yeah, we're honored to do the work, but honestly, we're not. We're you know, and we'll do it. But yeah. we're not a, we're not positioned in the way that the federal government yeah. is to standardize uh, thank, this information. Okay, thank, thanks for doing that. Talk about sort of our governmental entities. We have tried very hard in our work the last six years, uh, but we're naturally uh, in some ways focused on the federal government. But to always keep in mind SLTT, state, local, uh, territorial, and tribal governments, and uh, which are important uh, entities and include a lot of people in our. Uh, in the American family. So we're very happy the next two witnesses are actually representing uh, uh, both territorial and tribal uh, governments. First is Dr. Esther Ellis, who is the territorial epi epidemiologist for the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ellis, thanks very much for joining us. Please proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as, as you said, I'm the territorial epidemiologist for the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Health. Um, and I did want to thank the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense for um, inviting me to speak today. I'm very honored um, as a territory to be included in this very valuable discussion today. And um, for, for SARS-CoV-2, which causes the, the disease COVID-19, we in the, in the Virgin Islands has, have been working on January. We have, as part of preparedness, we have a pandemic plan um, that was updated and um, with input from our preparedness team, our territory and regional partners, CDC. Uh, we work very closely with CDC actually because we don't have a lot of resources that many states have and partner with them in, um, in a lot of laboratory testing, especially for high complexity testing that previously we haven't been able to do on island. Also have partnered with the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Association of State and Territorial Officials, or ASTO, and Customs and Border Protection. And our um, EOC, or Emergency Operations Center, response to COVID-19 was first initiated in January of this year. And lead members of our EOC remain on the front line and continue to provide guidance, problem-solving techniques, and daily interagency meetings led by the Department of um, Health in collaboration with uh, VITIMA, which is our Department of Virgin Islands Territorial Management Agency. And, um, and both teams have been working closely together. We meet daily um, to discuss our progress and, and needs moving forward. And in response to positive, COVID positive um, individuals or SARS-CoV-2 specifically um, positive individuals, those with acute infections, quarantine, is required and when it becomes necessary, individuals are self-quarantined at home with Virgin Islands Department of Staff checking on them daily. Uh, so we do have a small population, it's just over 100,000 individuals, so we do have the ability to work much more hands-on with each individual case um, than some big states have the capacity to do. And so um, we're, since we're checking on these individuals daily, if their symptoms change and medical attention is required, um, we can quickly transport them to the hospital with our um, emergency medical staff transport and they're identified prior to pickup so they can don appropriate PPE to protect our EMTs and other first responders. As in regards to the hospitals, we do have very limited um, hospital capacity here. Um, we hold daily hospital and health huddles with all hospitals within the territory. There are two to ensure an adequate supply of personal protective equipment is available and to verify isolation capacity and ensure that the ERs are equipped to screen and triage potential cases. Um, we only have the capacity within the territory right now to have seven um, individuals vented either in St. Croix or in St. Thomas, St. John district, that would be 14 total. And so we did work with the National Guard to outfit an additional um, structure to provide surge capacity for 25 patients if needed. We also work with the Department of Human Services and our mitigation lead and team members meet regularly to discuss the needs of the elderly, homeless, those in the childcare age range. Some of the major collaborations have been at the Behavioral Health Council 
um, which is ensuring wraparound services, especially meals, are provided for those in non-congregate housing for individuals and families in quarantine. Uh, we also were able to su be successful in prioritizing care for patients in need of cancer care. For seniors, we have collaborated with community organizations as well as DHS. Um, some, uh, some of these are the long-term recovery groups or VOAD, which provide case management and wraparound services for those who are especially vulnerable to COVID-19. Individuals with disabilities are also included in that in those services. And we've developed a mini MOUs uh, with partners, one of which is um, our, our various hotels within the territory to provide non-congregate housing um, quarantine options, either for residents or for visitors that become positive while they're on vacation here. Uh, our behavioral health division and public health office have also sought ways to reach out to seniors during this difficult period, because many of them are isolated even more so than they were prior to this outbreak. They're not able to receive visitors. Um, and, and so we're providing behavioral health um, services to those as needed. Um, and also we have um, recently, very exciting, we were the last state or territory to not have a public health lab. So we did receive some funding from the Centers for Disease Control to, to um, do that a couple of years ago. And we received our CLIA registration on February 18th. That was very timely. And since then we have been able to do patient testing and reporting locally. So efficient laboratory testing and contact trace is really essential to effective COVID-19 control. And prior to um, February 18th, we were shipping all of our samples off island to the Centers for Disease Control. And at one point, depending on what the surge testing was looking like in other states, the turnaround time was two weeks uh, to get a result back, which is not timely enough to do any kind of contact trace, tracing or control measures. So doing the testing locally has been a huge um, win for us. And two important benchmarks that we, that have been used nationally that um, should be met locally here to prevent widespread community transmission. First is the ability to test every case and their contacts is required. And second, uh, communities that demonstrate 10% or fewer positives in their testing results are indicative of sufficient testing and control. In May, only nine states were near or exceeded those benchmarks. And as a territory, we met that benchmark. The rates locally decreased um, starting at 15.2% in March, uh, percent positivity 3.4% in April. June was only 0.6%. And as we increased our doors to travelers again, uh, or opened our, our doors and hotels were allowed to make reservations again starting in July, our most recent seven day percent positivity as of yesterday was 9.55%. So local testing capacities have steadily increased and we're averaging now approximately 300 tests per day. The Department of Health is no longer sending any specimens to the Centers for Disease Control, which is great. And all testing is now being performed locally. In April, both hospitals were also supplied with the Abbott ID Now test, which is the quick um, a test, a uh, PCR test to check for acute infections. And uh, we have additional Abbott uh, ID Now test um, machines, equipment, and reagents on the way to the territory to provide some alternate testing sites. Uh, the territory has met important laboratory testing benchmarks and is continuing to maintain and improve local capacity. And additionally, the epidemiology division releases reports daily. It's really important to our population uh, to see these reports daily, um, the stakeholders, the, the report speaks to the total number of people tested each day, the number of positives, the number of active cases versus recovery versus fatal, if cases are travel related, close contacts of confirmed cases. Um, so if a case is attributable to travel, close contacts, or it's under investigation, we actually map all of our positive cases by a state um, the, the territory is broken up into estates within each island. That's not, um, that wouldn't be identifiable as far as an address and is a good way to map our data and can indicate any hot spots within the territory. Um, we have a, a high percentage of our uh, population that is diabetic and requires dialysis. So the EPI staff has met with the dialysis leads in the, in the territory. And um, this was actually back in May and completed a five page Corona 
virus disease uh, outpatient dialysis facility preparedness assessment tool and then assisted those facilities in ensuring that they met all of those needs. And, and it's, it's really important in the, those settings to limit the spread of COVID-19 to properly identify, separate, and ensure that ill patients are wearing both a cloth face covering um, or another more appropriate face covering. And recent studies have indicated that people who are infected but do not have symptoms likely also play a role in the spread of COVID-19. Our population here in the territory is actually very accepting of wearing the cloth face, face coverings. Um, I have noticed some, some states are and some aren't. So um, we are, are very accepting here. We have a no mask, no service policy. So if you do have to enter any facility within the territory, a, a face covering is required. We also have something unique to the territory, uh, a refinery that on St. Croix that is our largest employer and was having hundreds of contractors come in per week and most recently from states that were seeing a surge in cases um, and that contributed to our most recent initial surge in cases um, because these were travelers coming in from current hotspot areas and many of um, prior uh, because of that we required additional um, measures, mitigation measures for this population. And prior to coming here, these uh, contractors were tested and must have a negative result within 72 hours of departing their location. And upon uh, arrival, they were retested uh, within 72 hours and also had to have a negative result at that time uh, before being released from a quarantine facility. We have approximately 3,000 employees uh, and contractors for this business, and they're also temperature screened daily. And that is, is a big contributor to our most recent numbers. Uh, in conclusion, the Department of Health executive team and our extended Department of Health family has embraced the idea of collaboration and cooperation as a daily practice. And although we extend that practice across all agencies, the working relationships with our hospitals and human services has really been the closest. We will continue that effort as we move forward and especially with our most recent surge in cases. Uh, and I'd also just like to say to all our dedicated and hardworking staff, thank you. To our EMS service workers, uh, special thank you as our first responders um, are, are out on the front lines every day. Tibby, repeat my thank you to Dr. Ellis and introduce Dr. Kevin English, director of the Albuquerque area Southwest Tribal Epidemiology Center. Uh, Dr. English, uh, good to have you with us. Yes, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for including the Tribal Epidemiology Centers on your agenda today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Kevin English, and I'm the director of the Albuquerque Area Southwest Tribal Epidemiology Center, uh, which is a mouthful, so we go by the acronym Aztec. Our center serves 27 federally recognized American Indian tribes in Mexico, Southwest Colorado, and West Texas. We're one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers serving the American Indian and Alaska Native population across the country. For those of you who might not be familiar, tribal epidemiology centers were first established in 1996 under the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. We have seven core functions in consultation with and upon the request of tribes and urban Indian organizations. We, one, collect data and monitor progress made towards health status objectives and priorities of the American Indian and Alaska Native populations that we serve. Two, evaluate existing healthcare delivery and data systems that impact the improvement of American Indian and Alaska Native health. Three, assist the populations we serve in identifying highest priority health status objectives needed to achieve those objectives based on epidemiological data. Four, make recommendations for services needed by the American Indian and Alaska Native populations we serve. Five, make recommendations to improve healthcare delivery systems for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and urban Indians. And six and seven, we provide requested technical assistance and disease surveillance to assist American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, tribal organizations, and urban Indian communities to promote public health. It is important to note that each tribal epidemiology center may operationalize and prioritize these core functions differently based on the expressed needs of the population that we serve. 
It's further important to note here um, that when Congress enacted the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act in 2010, it permanently reauthorized the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And this reauthorization included a provision designating tribal epidemiology centers as public health authorities under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA. And this authorized tribal epidemiology center access to data by the United States Department of Health and Human Services. So given our role in advancing public health throughout Indian country, it should not be surprising that tribal epidemiology centers have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 response since the beginning. Our centers have been working in partnership with the American Indian and Alaska Native populations that we serve in a variety of ways, including developing and disseminating culturally appropriate communications products that raise awareness of the risk associated with the novel coronavirus and best practices for prevention and mitigation, conducting case investigations, contact tracing, and case and contact monitoring for American Indian and Alaska Native populations, assessing and facilitating the procurement of coronavirus testing and PPE, facilitating trainings and technical assistance on best practices for COVID-19 prevention and response, providing funding and other resources directly to tribal communities to support local COVID-19 prevention and response activities. And of course, gathering data and producing situational reports and other meaningful data products that monitor the burden of COVID-19 throughout Indian country and afford tribal partners and leaders greater opportunities to make those data-driven decisions prevention, response, mitigation, and recovery. It's also paramount to note here that tribal nations are sovereign nations. Therefore, while tribal epidemiology centers are always striving to produce the highest quality and most accurate and meaningful data for tribal communities, we abide by the standard that any tribe-specific data belongs to the tribe where it originated publicly through our centers. Rather, when we produce or obtain tribe-specific data, it is only disseminated to tribal leadership, which determines how to broadly share this information. At the same time, we do produce regional data reports for our service populations, data being de-identified at both the individual and tribal level. These publicly available reports still provide highly valuable and actionable information, data-driven decision-making, while simultaneously protecting the confidentiality and sovereignty of the tribal nations that we serve. As I talk to you today, though, I'd be remiss not to also mention some of the challenges that tribal epidemiology centers have experienced and are currently experiencing to access COVID-19 data for the American Indian and Alaska Native population. Some examples include a lack of interoperability across the tribal, state, and federal data systems, insufficient collection of race data in public health surveillance systems, as well as pervasive racial misclassification, lengthy and cumbersome approval processes to conduct data linkages to correct for racial misclassification and enhance the accuracy and completeness of data for American Indians and Alaska Natives, inconsistent sharing of data from states and or federal agencies to tribal epidemiology centers, incomplete transmission of public health surveillance data from states to federal agencies, and data suppression. And I'd like to just conclude these opening remarks with three actionable recommendations that would begin to alleviate some of the challenges that tribal epidemiology centers experience and would enhance the quality of data and public health surveillance throughout Indian country during COVID-19 and in the event of future public health threats and emergencies. First, we need to ensure that all federal agencies acknowledge and honor the public health authority of tribal epidemiology centers set forth in the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. This means directly sharing all public health data held by agencies of the U.S. Health and Human Services with tribal epi centers in a timely and complete fashion. Some key examples of these data systems include the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, the National Vital Statistics System, the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, the National Syndromic Surveillance Program, it's several risk factor surveillance systems, such as the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, youth risk behavior surveillance system, and the pregnancy risk assessment and monitoring system. 
The second recommendation is to assure complete public health data transmission from states to the CDC. For example, Tribal Epi Epidemiology Center directors have recently been informed by the CDC that links data is missing from more than half of the COVID-19 data that has been transmitted from states to the CDC. And in fact, in the two states with the largest American Indian and Alaska population in this country, race data is missing in over 99% of all COVID-19 records transmitted. The data also suffers from a lack of small area indicators such as zip sensing track, which is essential for us to generate the most accurate approximation tribe-specific data that can be shared with tribal leaders to make data-driven decisions to protect the health and wellness of their people. A related approach to this would be to ensure that cooperative agreements issued by federal agencies to states for public health surveillance include language requiring collaboration and data sharing with tribal epidemiologists. And finally, we need to ensure that tribes and tribal organizations have access to funding through the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program, as well as the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity for Prevention and Control of Emerging Infectious Diseases Program. Currently eligible recipients of these cooperative agreements include all states, several major metropolitan areas, and eight US territories. These dollars are essential and aim to strengthen capacity to effectively respond to a range of public health threats, including infectious diseases, as well as natural disasters and biological, chemical, and radiological events. However, none of the 573 federally recognized tribes have direct access to this funding. And this omission has effectively left Indian country out of national public health emergency response. And so again, thank you for this opportunity to comment and I'll conclude my opening. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dr. English. It was, uh, it was very informative, very helpful. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. So am I hearing you to say, doctor, that, um, that you as a tribal epidemiologist are having trouble getting the data for uh, the COVID-19 data that you really need from, uh, let's say, sur surrounding states and or the federal government? Yes. So the issue is really twofold. Um, at this time, we do not have a direct data sharing agreement with the CDC in order to receive this information directly from them. So there is progress. We have had discussions and there is movement and at least the COVID-19 data will soon be coming to our centers. And this is important because while it was already mentioned that the data is being collected at the state level, the challenge is some of our centers need to work with dozens of states in order to accurately and completely pull together the right. information that they need for their service population. But the other big challenge, and we didn't realize this until recently, and it sounds like it's already well understood um, by the tracking project, that is that the states are not fully transmitting all of their data to CDC. What the CDC can share in this instance for COVID-19 is going to be highly incomplete. They've already indicated to us that race is missing from over 50% of their Yeah. So we're gonna have very incomplete and inaccurate data even once we do get this um, data sharing flowing. So if I can ask you a pointed question, is the uh, absence of the race data um, a result, of, is it intentional or lazy or careless or what? So we don't know the answer to that question. I don't think we've spoken with somebody high enough at CDC that could answer that for us. We don't know if it's just a general reluctance of the states to transmit full and complete data. I mean, this data yeah. is also missing underlying health conditions. It's missing symptoms. It's missing a lot of valuable information that should be being transmitted to the CDC. I don't know the root cause of that lack of full transmission. Okay. We have a couple things that we could say about this if you'd, if you'd like. Um, yes. One is that there's just tremendous variability between the states on this. Uh, some states actually are fairly complete uh, on at least their cases, uh, their death data. Most states are better at deaths than they are at cases. And on the cases data, you know, the variation is it's truly tremendous, like from, you know, single digits in Texas, uh, at least recently, uh, to some states, you know, getting 50, 60, you know, 70 percent. Um, 
race and ethnicity data attached to, uh, to individual cases. Our understanding is that um, the issues mostly are at the point of care. Um, you know, somebody orders a laboratory test, they don't fill out all the fields. Those fields are significant, you know, at an epidemiological level, but maybe the individual care provider just kind of goes, oh, I'm not going to ask this person that, and it, and it moves on. Um, and you know, you you bundle that up over time, and, and you have quite a quite a large problem. Um, our other understanding is that you know HHS in the beginning of June uh, released new guidelines um, stating that laboratory test results should come with race and ethnicity data attached, and that states should you know make a a, a greater effort to uh, make sure that that happens, um, and that's supposed to go into effect by August first. I think there's uh, my understanding from talking to people I know is that, again, some states are probably going to do a good job and others uh, a less good job or just don't have the resources to um, or the or the modernized data systems to make that happen efficiently. And so right now with some other of our sort of funders and partners, have, we're trying to figure out if we can track if that the August 1st deadline actually has uh, a major impact on, on improving. Right. Uh, Mr. Magical, let me ask you a related but different question. Uh, are you are you finding um, in, in your data gathering uh, differences or disparities between states? I don't mean on the racial question. Generally, that are, are surprising to you? Yeah, I, I would say that we have found, um, by and large, that states are all doing some version of right. But the amount of historical data transparency and clarity in, in the data definitions, like does your case definition, in, for that data point, does it include probable cases or not? If it includes probable cases, are you using the CSTE slash CDC definition of a probable case, or are you putting any antibody test positive just into that category. We have the same thing on deaths. You know, are you reporting confirmed and probable deaths separately? Um, if you're not reporting them separately, that generates some problems. Um, but the biggest problem is that if any state lumps things together, um, and there are a lot of good reasons why things get lumped together, we encounter this in our own project, um, then it becomes very difficult to generate clean data streams of just confirmed things and just probable things, which, which has some, some impact. I would say that the, um, probably the, uh, the biggest surprise is that a lot of the small states are actually doing quite a good job. Uh, we, I think going in, anticipated that kind of known good public health departments like Massachusetts and Washington, New York, right. would be good. Um, but we've been, for example, we've been very impressed with Indiana. We've been very impressed by Arkansas. Um, and so it does seem that it's not purely about the size of the state or, you know, kind of what we know about the financial resources in general, but that there's also these underlying, um, you know, just whether or not that state has good public health department and whether um, the data systems they have um, sure. ha have been updated. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm going to uh, throw it over to uh, Tom Dasher. Or maybe Lisa Monaco. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly ask a couple of questions. Dr. Yeah, English, as you were describing the challenges you face on, uh, on tribal lands, uh, I was curious. You didn't mention the Indian Health Service and the extraordinary infrastructure and, and personnel challenges that the IHS has had for years. How does their current circumstances affect your efforts? And, and uh, are you hopeful at all that that can be addressed either with additional financial help as we look at a new COVID legislation and more support from the federal government? Or how do you just look at the overall capacity for IHS to be engaged successfully? Sure, I'll do my best to address that, at least from our service area. So as I mentioned at the top, um, we serve um, tribal communities in New Mexico, Southwest Colorado, and West Texas. About half of the communities that we serve are 
still what we would call direct services tribes, meaning they receive their health care directly from Indian Health Services. Our center currently meets with Indian Health Service and our departments of health on a weekly basis, and we have been throughout the pandemic. What I have seen from IHS is that they're doing a strong job at um, administering rapid testing and helping to fill in some of the gaps in testing that we have on tribal lands in our region. But where I think we're creating some, we still have some challenges and um, they're not going away. I think we're starting to see them more and more. And that is that we have data systems that don't talk to each other. So when we're talking about data, information that's being collected by Indian Health Service is just being maintained by Indian Health Service. Um, so at this point, you know, the Native American population prevalence estimates um, that Indian Health Service is looking at would be very incomplete. Um, because in this case, as I mentioned, half of the tribal communities we serve are not directly being served by Indian Health Service. So we do have some fragmented data. We don't have interoperability between the data systems of Indian Health Service and the states and or the federal government outside of IHS. So this data is all in different places and it needs to come together. There needs to be some type of interoperability between systems. The same would be true for trying to do contact tracing. If we're not all able to work from the same electronic data platform, it makes this work extremely difficult. And so these are some of the challenges that we've come across, given the fact that we're working with several different entities, federal and state and tribal, to try and all work together to be on the same page there have certainly been a number of challenges there. Thank you, it's very helpful. Um, I was gonna ask uh, Alexis a, a question. He's, yep. I, I don't, oh, there you oh, are. I'm right here. Up yeah. in the, you moved in my screen. <laughs> uh, let me just ask you, I, I think Dr. English's uh, comment is a good segue to the question I was gonna ask you. I've, since this whole crisis began, I've been dubious about the quality of data collection, given the enormous uh, 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 challenges logistically, and he talked about lack of interoperability, and we've quite a bit of time talking about that today, but I, I guess, you know, when we look at polls, we, we always look at them with a plus or minus uh, uh, margin of error, and I, could you just talk a little bit about your confidence level around data and mm -hmm. the degree to which our assertions around the, the information we have based on data uh, are accurate enough? At a basic level, this is not a super high quality data set. We can just definitively say that. Um, I think that it varies um, by metric. We feel, again, like the hospitalization data is, is quite solid. And one reason is that it's collected by the hospital associations by and large, and it's collected uh, on a daily basis. And at least, you know, we've helped out a couple of hospital associations with some coding things to help them do what they do more easily. Um, but that strikes me as very solid uh, survey data um, that as long as you get a high enough percentage of the hospital systems reporting in, it, it actually works quite well. Um, we feel like the case data, of course, is, is incomplete um, by its very nature. You know, you're only capturing who knows. We, uh, that's actually a, a hotly disputed number. Are we capturing 10% uh, of the cases now, 20%, 30%? Um, no one's actually sure of that number. Uh, some of the seroprevalence surveys using antibodies to assess uh, how many people were infected versus how many you know, active uh, infections we were able to diagnose at the time have shown obviously we missed in the spring uh, huge percentages uh, of cases. So we know just on, on the face of it, that's you know, uh, that, that data is, is fragmentary. Um, on the other hand, we can also look at are, are the trends correct? When we see cases going up and we, ha we have test data to accompany it so that we can look at the percent positivity rate um, uh, for, for that state or territory, um, I think those two numbers combined with hospitalizations give you a fairly good picture. Like if you look at those three things and you see that it's not just that testing is far, you know, out, outstripping what it did in the past, um, then you can say, okay, we have a, we have growing infection in the community. Um, and I think if you wait a few more weeks, you'll see the deaths too, you know, and we're already starting to see that movement in this current surge. So, I, you know, the data has quirks. It's not great. I also do think it's still uh, useful. 
I still think that um, I rather we have it than we don't have it. Um, and anything we can do to continue standardizing that data will make it more useful for everyone. Particularly, you know, I think if, if we think about the tribal epidemiologists, they face actually a similar uh, problem to the, the PACs, you know, like the Western States Pact, um, in trying to coordinate efforts across state boundaries. Um, they're going to run into the same problems we have and the same problems um, that the tribal epidemiologists have had. Um, it's, it's really crucial that these standards um, get put in place and that, are, and, and that they're followed. Thanks uh, very much to our uh, uh, three witnesses here. You've been very helpful. I hope you will feel free to keep in touch with us uh, through uh, Dr. George if you've got suggestions to us or frankly just things you need help on. And um, we're not exactly from the federal government and here to help but we're, we're a, a, a public-private group and here to help. And thank you, all three of you, for everything you are doing to help in a, uh, a very a critical time for our country. Okay, be well. I'm going to turn the gavel over to Jim Greenwood uh, in the absence of Governor Ridge uh, to maintain the exquisite bipartisanship that has characterized this commission. Congressman Crow, can you hear me? I can hear you. Am I coming in all right? Yes, you are. Thank you for being with us and thank you for um, being prompt. I'm Jim Greenwood. Um, I used to be a member of Congress. I left, as my colleagues have heard me say, undefeated and unindicted in 2005. Um, but it's <laughs> nice to see a fresh recruit on board. Uh, so let me um, uh, have the honor of introducing the Congressman. Jason Crow is from Colorado's sixth district. He is serving his first term, having defeated an incumbent. He's a former Army Ranger and an attorney. Uh, he serves on the Armed Services Committee, on the Subcommittee on Innovation and Workforce Development. Uh, he it was one of the seven um, impeachment officers, uh, re representing uh, impeachment manager, I should say. It's a pretty high wire act for a freshman, I would say. Uh, he worked his way through college. He enlisted in the Army, did three tours in uh, in the army in Iraq, in Iraq and Afghanistan. He took part in the Battle of Samoa. Am I saying that right? Samoa. Samoa. Um, in 2003 and uh, earned a, um, a bronze star there. Uh, our our co-chair, Governor Ridge, uh, is a fellow bronze star uh, recipient. He's done, he had to leave us, but he was a platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne and upon his return, uh, spent a lot of his time helping service veterans um, transition from military to civilian life. He has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Wisconsin and a law degree from the University of Denver, uh, Durham College of Law. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you for your service to your country, um, both uh, before and uh, now that you're in Congress. Before Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's uh, it's very good to be with you. I appreciate the invitation to join this very distinguished group of commissioners and others. So I look forward to the, the conversation here today. Um, did you want me to, to kick off with just with some introductory remarks? I mean, what, what, uh, kind of at your pleasure here. Yeah, please do. Yep, great. Well, uh, you know, this group knows this issue very well. I, I know you've lived it, you've legislated it. Uh, what's interesting about this issue is, uh, although this is the first pandemic that we have seen uh, in about a hundred years, a little over a hundred years since the 1918 Spanish flu, at least of this size and scale and of this nature, uh, this is not something that uh, is a case of first impression for the government. And, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here with the, uh, the, the commissioners, but you know, we have dealt with um, outbreaks. Uh, obviously, we've, we've had situations like Ebola, swine flu, avian flu, and others that we've been able to successfully can contain and respond to uh, in a, um, uh, a multilateral way with our allies and with other countries and engagement and uh, WHO and, and other uh, mechanisms. So uh, we're not uh, in a situation where we have to reinvent the wheel. We also know that we have the, the National Biodefense Strategy, the NDS, the National Security Presidential Memorandum 14, 
as well as the February 2020 GAO recommendations that look to implement some of the prior work and guidance uh, that was done uh, under two uh, last two administrations uh, uh, to try to uh, have a cohesive response here. So uh, this is a long way of saying there's a lot of work that's already been done. We have a, a body of data, we have a, a, some infrastructure uh, that has uh, already been put in place. So from my perspective, what I've looked at, what do we have to do to respond to the current crisis and start getting our arms around it? How can we leverage the work that's already been done, uh, work with some existing infrastructure, uh, but also adapt to the current environment and add additional resources as necessary to get our arms around this as quickly as possible? So I kind of view this in a, in a construct, uh, like a, like a three-legged stool. And the, the legs to the stool for me are, number one, the infrastructure and uh, in, in the government structures that we have in place. That's one leg of the stool. The other is the workforce, whether or not we have the right people on the bus to get us to where we need to go. And then the third is the resources. So let me talk about the, the infrastructure piece first. I've worked with uh, my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Elise Stefanik, to introduce a bill called the RASPAC, Responsibility and Accountability for Strategic Pandemic Planning. And what the RASPAC aims to do is to take the over 400 authorities and guidelines uh, and other sources of um, uh, information uh, and uh, influence that the government can have, taking over, over 400 of those pieces across dozens of different agencies, and they, this takes a lot of different sources, all the way from law to regulation to guidelines to circular, circulars and, and, you know, and, and all the other different things that our agencies have, uh, and coordinate them all, conduct a complete inventory of all of the guidelines that we have and all the authorities we have in the federal government and put them all in one place. Because uh, there's a lot out there, uh, but we don't have a good grasp on, on what all is out there and who uh, has to do what. That's the first big thing that the RASPAC does. The second thing that the RASPAC does is it requires the agencies to enter into a memorandum of understanding to clearly delineate their authorities, how they're going to communicate with each other uh, in kind of a chain of command, so to speak, uh, in, in a time of crisis so that we can all make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music. Now, uh, the other thing I did in addition to introducing the RASPAC uh, is I uh, just uh, two weeks ago got an amendment in the NDAA uh, since I sit on the armed services uh, to uh, have the OMB put together a comprehensive budget for biodefense planning because we have line items across all different agencies, but we don't actually have a budget for responding to this. Uh, there's no dollar amount that's fixed that brings together all the different line items in, in the different agencies to look at what is this costing us now? Uh, what is it going to cost us to do it in the right way? Uh, and, and as you all know better than me, uh, from the very, uh, very deep experience legislatively on this commission, uh, you know, it, it, it begins and ends, at least on the Hill, with dollar amounts. Uh, so if we can get our arms around the money uh, and actually have a budget, I think that it will give us a lot more ability to um, influence the discussion and look at what we need to do going forward. So that's on the coordination infrastructure piece. Now, on the public workforce piece, what has become very clear is that we don't have anywhere near the public health workforce that we need to deal with a pandemic. Uh, Dr. Fauci and others have told me that we need uh, about 300,000 additional public health workforce personnel in the coming months just to do contact tracing. Now, that's not even to do uh, the, the immunizations that, you know, it, when and if we get an immunization, uh, that uh, we're going to need to actually conduct uh, broad-based immunizations of hundreds of millions of Americans. So just to do the contact tracing, we need an additional 300,000 folks. Uh, and then you can add on top of that all the other work that needs to be done in addition to the public health, existing public health workload. So... Um, I've done two things. I've joined with Senator Michael Bennett, my colleague from Colorado, uh, and I have the House Companion of the Health, uh, uh, the health Force Bill that would basically create a one million additional uh, health workers to deal with contact tracing, immunization, and all the other things we need to do to get our arms around this in the long run. The second thing I did, uh, and this was in response to working with my local public health agency in my district, was introduce a public loan forgiveness program 
for folks that want to go into uh, public health agency work. Uh, so Dr. Don, John Douglas uh, is the, the uh, executive director of the public health agency that oversees my three county uh, district. Uh, and in a conversation a couple of months ago, uh, Dr. Douglas and I were talking about what needs to done, be, be done because he said he just doesn't have the people, plain and simple. He just can't actually do the contact tracing. And he said the single biggest barrier is young men and women cannot afford to come to work for my agency. They just can't do it. Uh, if they graduate from a, a, a public health program, they're looking at you know anywhere from fifty to $150,000 of student loans. They're paying $1,500 a month. They can't afford to go to work for my agency. So what my bill do, does, which is also a bipartisan bill, uh, is uh, it will we'll give those folks $35,000 a year for each year of service, up to $105,000 uh, for a three-year term of service for a public health uh, agency uh, for, for them to help us get through this pandemic. Uh, so we've done that as well to help address the surge capacity need. Now, on the last piece, the resources piece, uh, I already talked about the OMB amendment to try to get our arms around what the overall line item is, but it's also abundantly clear that we don't have the industrial base to actually uh, satisfy the PPE that's needed uh, at this time right now, nor do we have the national stockpile. So uh, I, I'm leading a couple of Defense Production Act efforts in the House that will help uh, A, force the president to invoke the DPA so we can actually start replenishing the national stockpile because we don't even have phase one of the pandemic under control, not to mention phase two uh, or phase three. Uh, you know, we are at the height of summer right now, and this thing is out of control, uh, let alone what, what it's going to look like this fall when we actually enter cold and flu season. So we need to be making very aggressive moves now to replenish the national stockpile, uh, and, and we need to invoke the DPA to do that. And that's what industry is telling me we need to do, because uh, the executives that run these companies say, you know, listen, we actually want you to invoke the DPA uh, because we have, uh, you know, fiduciary obligations to our shareholders that make it very challenging for us uh, to do this. Uh, we have a kind of a free-for-all market system right now that's prompting uh, a, a lot of price gouging and other things going. If you want to lower the prices, if you want to have some coordination, we need the DPA to do that. Uh, so uh, let's get that done to replenish the national stockpile. And let's look at what we need to do and conduct a comprehensive assessment and one of my bills does this, a comprehensive assessment of our, of our industrial base and what we need to do to build that industrial base in the long run to actually create uh, and manufacture this PPE in the United States so we're not reliant on other countries to do so. So those are kind of the three legs of the stool as I see it, uh, at least from my perspective as a sitting member and, and the efforts that I'm undertaking right now to address uh, both the, the near-term crisis and some of the long-term infrastructure challenges that we have. Thank you, Congressman. Um, and let me commend you for um, developing the expertise that you have uh, in this year, your first term. It's, uh, it's impressive. Um, have you had the opportunity to familiarize yourself with the um, blueprint that uh, for biodefense that this commission um, uh, published in 2015? I, I have looked at it, yes. I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on it. <laughs> so I, I won't be able to dive deep, uh, but I, I am familiar with the, the aspects of it and, and the work you've done. Well, I, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to quiz you on it right now. <laughs> but, uh, I, I do commend it to you because a lot of what you've said about trying to look at the various buckets within DOD uh, and trying to unify um, the spending on biodefense there, we address not a, across all of the, a variety of agencies. <clears throat> So I would commend it to you to be to literally be a blueprint for some things that you might want to consider going forward. We'll take another hard look at it, and I'll, okay. I'll uh, reassess it with my staff. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the, my question is a is a, a more parochial one, actually, and that is: we, in, in, earlier today, we've we're all been lamenting, or many of us have been lamenting the, um, the, the, the politicalization of this issue and how it's actually remarkably uh, shamefully and shockingly become a partisan issue how, how what's your experience of that been in the sixth district of colorado have you found that your constituents are taking this as a you know taking basing their behavior uh, on their on their politics and, and to the extent that you have 
how, how do you how are you dealing with that how are you counseling your own constituents um, yeah it's been a real struggle i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sugarcoat it uh, the fact that something that should be as simple as following the direction of, of researchers and scientists and our doctors uh, that is just proven to work uh, there's just not even any debate about it uh, has become a political issue uh, and I think what that illustrates to me is that the tone at the top matters. You know, what our leaders do uh, and don't do, what they say and don't say, uh, both in their, their talk uh, and in their actions, uh, the, the leadership of their, their example, matters an awful lot. So you take something that uh, should be as simple as us uh, you know, wearing masks, which, you know, I, I don't like to do it. It's not fun. It's not uh, great. It, uh, it's not pleasant. But... Um, it's my obligation. You know, I, I talk often in my seat, uh, and I uh, am a uh, quote unquote swing district Democrat. I represent a purple seat. So uh, I'm very used to having conversations across the political spectrum. Uh, I talk frequently about uh, not just the rights of citizenship, because I think uh, we, we talk, to, you know, plenty about, you know, what are, what are my rights? You know, what am I owed as a citizen? But you know what? Uh, what I learned in the Army is that citizenship also comes with duties and responsibilities. You know, the, the corollary of those rights are duties and responsibilities to our country, uh, to our states, uh, to our neighbors, to our families. Uh, and uh, for me, this is an easy calculus, is if I can do something that uh, fulfills my rights and, and duties to the country uh, by helping us economically recover faster, uh, by helping us uh, keep our senior citizens and vulnerable folks healthy, uh, our grandmas, our grandpas, our, our, uh, help us open our schools faster, then I'm going to do it, whether it's inconvenient to me or not, because this isn't a matter of inconvenience to me. Uh, this is a matter of what I need to do. So that's how I, I talk about it within uh, my district. Uh, and generally in Colorado, we're doing better than most. You know, we're not perfect. Uh, I think we have a, a pretty high rate of compliance with uh, these these guidelines and uh, both mandatory and suggested, uh, but uh, it, it, it the divisions are deepening. I mean, we've had people. I had somebody shot at a, a chef at a Waffle House, uh, you know, killed uh, in my district for recommending that, that a customer uh, wear a mask. Uh, this has become the mask issue has become a symbol uh, uh, of this larger vitriol and cultural debate that we're having in America. Right now, it's become the flashpoint. Uh, and, and the unfortunate part about it is that uh, unlike other symbols and flashpoints of this cultural debate, this has very real and immediate health, life, and economic consequences to um, people of my community and people of the country. Thank you. Senator Lieberman. Uh, thanks, Jim. Congressman, <clears throat> thanks for your service. Um, I'm really impressed by the actions you've taken already uh, in this area. They're very, um, they're very practical and sensible. I must tell you that one of the things that startled me when we uh, did our first work 2014-15 is that th there was nobody in the federal government who could tell us how much the federal government was spending every year on defense. It was amazing. We got an estimate from an institute at the University of Pittsburgh. But anyway, what you're doing is important. I'm, uh, and also on the, on the is it RASPAC, R-A-S-P-A-C? R-R-A-S-P-P, -P. RASP. P -P. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I was a, a younger man, the, uh, the relevant term was Rat Pack, which was uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, <laughs> and a few others who appeared in Las Vegas. Anyway. The coordination is the other part of it, and I really appreciate that you're trying to do that. There was a period there not so long ago where uh, some of the members of the House, I know Adam Schiff, I believe maybe Benny Thompson, talked about creating a commission to look back at how this started earlier this year, but also really, I thought, to look at the organization of the federal government and see if something different was required. Do you have any sense of whether there's a chance to do that before the election or, or perhaps after? Uh, yeah, Senator, uh, uh, yeah, thanks for that, that question. Uh, I, I'm not optimistic that that would happen before the election. Uh, it, it has just become, I'm just gonna be honest, it's become close to impossible to right. negotiate with this, with this uh, White House right now. Uh, and in part, it's because it, it just changes all the time, right? I mean, you might 
think that you're negotiating and on the path to gain something done and then it just changes the next day. So um, uh, that, that's really challenging. I do think there's a chance to look at it after the election. And actually there is one uh, thing that I've been pushing for and I'm gonna continue to push for and I would actually love this commission's thoughts on this because you, you probably have better thoughts on it than I do. But uh, what I think we need to do is elevate FEMA uh, into a cabinet level agency. Uh, because well, one of the challenges that I've seen talking to both agency, but also talking to some folks and some academic researchers that have actually looked at the structure of these agencies is they said that uh, DHS is largely a law enforcement agency, right? It was created after 9-11. It has the culture and the structure of a law enforcement agency. Then FEMA uh, is largely a regional based disaster response agency right, to respond to natural disasters, to tornadoes, to floods within regions, to flex resources from one area to the next. But when you have a nationwide emergency, it's less capable of addressing that. And it, because it also doesn't, it's not a cabinet level agency, uh, then it has to go through, obviously, DHS to, to get the attention that it needs from the president. So my, my view is we escalate FEMA or something similar to a cabinet level uh, position to give it the authority and the standing with vis-a-vis uh, -vis the president uh, that would help us address this. But I'd, I'd obviously be you know, curious as to your thoughts. No, that's that's a really fresh thinking and worth our considering. I mean, it happens that I was involved in both uh, organizations or reorganizations uh, because of my committee, uh, which was governmental affairs, homeland security first. Uh, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11, and then the, the reorganization of FEMA to make it regional after FEMA failed miserably in Hurricane Katrina. And there it was really, we made it regional, and it's done really well since because different regions have mm -hmm. different kinds of emergency problems. We really didn't contemplate at yeah. that point, uh, I must say something like this, which was national, a national uh, infectious disease pandemic. So I think it's a, it's a fresh idea, and uh, I, I promise you we will, uh, on this commission, consider it. Uh, I hope we can keep in touch with you. You're, you're doing some really uh, constructive thinking on this, and I thank you for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank Jim, you. Back to you. Thank you. Senator Daschle. Great to see you again, Jason. Thanks for yeah. your participation today. Uh, you did a fantastic job when we were out in Colorado uh, the last time we were together and appreciate very much your insights today. One of the concerns that uh, I have that have really has really not gotten much attention at all, and you touched on it briefly, but it's the confluence of seasonal flu and COVID this fall. We expect to see an enormous uh, increase in uh, the seasonal flu, and I worry a lot about the degree of willingness people are going to have to vac get vaccinated, given the circumstances we're facing now. I worry a lot about resources and whether or not we'll have them to address the seasonal flu side of things. But could you talk a little bit about how you see it from your perspective? Uh, and as you look at this COVID uh, phase five legislation, do you think there's much of a prospect that that will be on the table at all as we begin to look at how we address the situation this fall? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Good to see you again as well. Thanks for all your continued work here. Uh, let me address that last one first. I, I, I am optimistic that there will be a phase five stimulus bill. I think the pressure on the Senate at this point is just too high uh, from our state and local communities that largely were cut out of uh, the first uh, four rounds of stimulus, as you know, because of the 500,000 uh, uh, population threshold. So for example, in Colorado, most of our cities and counties are under 500,000, so most were cut, cut out of that. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and by the way, most of my mayors are Republicans, right? And, and they're the ones that are working with me to, to beat the drum to get this done, uh, to, to get the, the stimulus bill moving. So I do think it's gonna happen, uh, as also as, as we look at school reopening, because that's becoming the next, uh, uh, big crisis uh, point here uh, as we're looking at reopening schools in about five weeks in Colorado and we don't have really a great plan to do that and no one really does. Um, we need the resources to do it. So I am optimistic it'll get done. Uh, you know, the, the timeline, I just don't know. I know the Senate's in session, I think, until August 
eighth, I believe. Uh, and then, um, then we're gonna have to work something out and conference it. But we're pretty far apart right now between the HEROES Act, which is our $3 trillion bill, uh, and what the, the Senate was looking at was somewhere between 500 billion and a trillion that was just uh, kind of state and local community uh, stimulus money. We're gonna have, we'll have to reconcile that. So uh, that's, that's on the, the first point. And then, um, sorry, I got carried away on, on my, <laughs> my stimulus. What was the first part of the question? I was talking about the confluence of seasonal flu and COVID and right. just how we look at the challenges around that, whether vaccination is even plausible given skepticism and the degree of concern people have generally. Um, I think it's gonna be a, a huge issue. We lose anywhere from 60 to 80,000 people a year to seasonal flu. So on mm -hmm. top of the COVID situation, we could really see a complicated set of circumstances this fall. I'm just wondering if it's yeah. on the, uh, you know, on, on the radar for members of Congress as we look to circumstances in the fall. Yeah, it's on my radar, and I, so we have this perfect storm that's brewing, right? We have a, a continued uh, increase in the current phase of coronavirus, not even phase two or three. It just hasn't stopped, right? It's increased. So the, the normal that downtick that we were actually anticipating hasn't happened. So that's happening at the same time as our, uh, our counties and our cities are actually running 25 to 40% deficits because of the economic issue. So the, the bandwidth uh, of our cities, which you know, are where the rubber meets the road in terms of providing uh, frontline public health response, our public health agencies, our health clinics and others, uh, are not gonna have the money that they're gonna need uh, really soon, they're going to run out of money. Uh, so they're, 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 we're having that problem there. Then you look at school reopening. Then you also look at another thing that's happening is the normal vaccination rates uh, for all other diseases and illnesses are going down, right? Because people aren't going into their, pedi their pediatrician. They're not going into their hospital. They're not going in for their regular wellness checks. So they're not, we're, we're behind uh, on our current vaccinations, which is going to create an additional a burden on our surge capacity as uh, people get more sick than they would otherwise because they're not getting those vaccinations. Uh, and then, um, th you know, th then you have obviously this, this burgeoning kind of culture war around the issue. So all four of those things are going to converge, I think, between now and October. Uh, and unless we, we re respond, I think, really rapidly, it's going to be uh, very uh, dire. Thank you, Congressman. Appreciate your thoughts and insights. Um, I want to go back and, and keep talking a little bit about the commission idea. So the, uh, look, I, we talked in our last commission meeting about the idea that there would be some kind of commission uh, appointed, um, established by legislation, uh, a la the 9-11 commission. And um, I was actually in the Justice Department back then, and last thing I wanted at the time was a commission and all the document and information requests and testimonies and everything that it would entail. But it ended up being, I think, a, a very good exercise for the country, um, not only to tell the story, and a large part of it was to tell the story of that particular commission, but also to prescribe reforms going forward. Whether we need the telling the story part so much here or not is a different story, but in terms of the reforms, proposals for changes to our government, uh, I just think it's the best way to tee those up, tee them up credibly, and give them some momentum for legislation and adoption and basically to be embraced by the, the government. Um, so I, I, I get what you're saying about the politics of the situation, that it's, um, you know, that to date there's been uh, no interest in pursuing a commission, um, at least from the White House. It seems nonsensical to me because of a because of the merits of their of, of having a commission but also the commission's not going to be rendering any opinions before the election anyway um yeah. it's not going to get rolling and actually uh, finish its job until well after the election and um so there's no political downside to go ahead and agreeing to it and i just wonder um whether it's worth another push now um you know the uh, landscape is a little different now than it was a month ago we're seeing that this isn't going to fade away. This is, it's come back with a vengeance. And I think people realize this is more serious than maybe they thought it was a month ago. And so I wonder whether it's worth sort of another political push. And I guess uh, looking at it, and I'm not about politics here, but looking at it politically, I'm not sure to see a downside to making that political push. 
uh, yeah. at this time. And I just think it really is important. I'd hate to wait six more months before we even stand up the commission, which might then be a prerequisite to any fundamental changes to better prepare ourselves for the next pandemic that could be happening as soon as next year. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you, right? I mean, I, I, I think we're on the, <laughs> we're, we're definitely on the same page um, here. Um, and this is my opinion. This isn't obviously the commission's opinion and people might agree, but I think there's just a, 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 a feel us, we're just not on the same page right now with the administration because um, there are those that believe that we don't have a problem uh, or don't want to recognize that there's a problem. I just want to ignore it. And then there are also those that think that even if we do have a problem, that it's not a government a problem or that government doesn't have a role in addressing the problem. Um, but that's a philosophical challenge, right? If, if, that, if that's the, the hump that we need to get over, uh, that's a big one, right? Uh, so how do we, how do we if, we're, if we're not even agreeing that there's a problem uh, at the outset, and then secondarily, we're not agreeing that, that government has a role in addressing it, um, then all the other elements of the discussion kind of become moot. Uh, and I think that's the point we're at right now. If we're having frank talk, I think that's the, the real challenge is we have to try to get everyone on the same page that we have a major crisis, that many people are dying, that our economy is in free fall and it's actually going to get worse um, in that uh, number, uh, number one. And then number two, that uh, the federal government has a role in addressing it. Now, both of those, you know, I, I, I think you know, for me go, go without saying, uh, but uh, there's a lot right now that doesn't go without saying, unfortunately. That's, that's, that's well said. Um, let, let me just ask, I guess, the other side of the coin, um, talking about reform of the executive branch largely. Uh, what about in terms of oversight? You know, and one of the things that we've talked about over the years is, is the effectiveness of congressional oversight in the biodefense area. And in, as with so many areas, you know, anything having to do with DHS, for example, you, you know, you, we have fragmented uh, oversight responsibility up on the Hill. I was wondering if you think that this might be an occasion that would um, prompt the Hill to think about, okay, at least in the biodefense pandemic area, let's see if we can harmonize our sort of numerous committee and subcommittee oversight assignments and consolidate responsibility, which I know asking members of Congress to relinquish jurisdiction is uh, a bit of a pipe dream, but query whether given the, the dimensions of this crisis, um, now might be the time for Congress to look within its own house and say, hey, maybe we could, we could do oversight and push the executive branch more effectively. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I oversight is a huge part of what I think we need to be doing. Uh, and, you know, we formed uh, an oversight uh, committee is part of the CARES Act. So we're doing already oversight for how the stimulus money is being spent. And absolutely, I agree that there's going to have to be a, a, a kind of a, a, a commission of sorts. We can call it whatever we want to call it, but kind of similar to the 9-11 commission that did you know, a, a bipartisan, nonpartisan, uh, full 360 assessment of what happened and how we can go forward. Some really great things came out of that. I mean, incredible recommendations and assessment. Uh, and I think we're going to have to go through that process again afterwards. Um, but I also think we have to recognize that um, we, we, we know a lot of what we need to be doing, right? I mean, there, there's, uh, we, uh, you know, there are so many things that we know we need to be doing, that we can be doing, that we actually have the tools to do, both legal tools and other resources that we can do right now uh, that can put us in a much better position uh, to, be, to be addressing the crisis that we're just not doing, right? We have the Defense Production Act. We have the authority, it works. It's worked before, we've used it before. Uh, private industry's asking us to invoke it and use it. Uh, we're just not doing it. Uh, so um, I think we, we have to, uh, again, in the interest of, of frank talk here, um, I think we have to recognize that there's a lot that we already know uh, that's just not happening. Uh, and then after the fact, as, as we kind of get through the crisis, uh, and we can take a step back and look at things uh, in a more uh, uh, kind of neutral uh, way when we're not in crisis mode, I think that's going to have to be done too. And I think that uh, Congress plays a role in that. 
Okay, thanks. Back to you, Jim. Okay, thank you, Ken. We have a few more minutes. If, do, do any of the ex officio uh, members of the panel um, wish to uh, pose a question to the Congressman? This is a great conversation. Thank you so much. I want to delve in a little because of your committee on the armed services and get into the defense world, but it, earlier today we were talking really about um, some international issues too in our reach. <clears throat> so previously, I think, you know, we see these emer diseases emerge because they come through the gaps in our, you know, traditional programs. And over the last year, some of the programs have been pulling back and, and more focused on core missions. So at Homeland Security, they've kind of dropped their kind of looking around the world at emerging disease issues and more focused on the border. Uh, over the fall, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, they started to have to reevaluate their th mission and let's focus more on, on the troops and the military rather than the broader threat reduction. Um, so I just want to kind of get your thoughts. I mean, I see that DITRA program on threat reduction around the world is really, you know, being defending America from those threats. And a lot of people we talk to in defense and related to health also say, well, defense is about military. It's not about defending America. It's about military activity. So I just wonder if you have some thoughts on, you know, where we can go. Could defense uh, department, those programs are probably small given the Pentagon budget, but they're fairly sizable compared to USAID or NIH on some things like emerging diseases for CENTCOM and AFRICOM and PACCOM and those yeah. efforts. And are you hearing that conversation and, and their um, interest in kind of using those programs to protect us more? Yeah, and, and, and particularly in DITRA, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the in Intelligence and Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee. I'm the vice chair of that subcommittee now. So we oversee DITRA and, 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 and some of these other agencies and programs. So the answer is yes. Uh, and um, I, I think we would make a huge mistake by not looking at this as a national security and defense issue, uh, because it is, right? Um, number one, our adversaries are looking at what's happening right now. Uh, and they're looking at how easy it would be to spread disease and, and flu and other things. Uh, and uh, they, can, they, they can do it far easier and cheaper than they can do almost anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So, and actually we know, uh, without getting into too much detail, we know that they're looking at this and looking at how to kind of weaponize uh, this issue. Uh, they have been actually before, I mean, this commission knows that. <laughs> They've been looking at it for a long time, but they're looking at this in real time now uh, in terms of, uh, how can they use this, this current pandemic and, and keep it going, so to speak, because it's in their interest in a lot of ways to kind of keep this instability and, and issue going. So uh, number one, they are looking at that. Number two, I'd be remiss if I didn't I mention climate change, uh, because one of the major impacts of climate change we know is pandemic, right? As the temperature of the, uh, of the earth increases and uh, disease vectors increase, whether it's uh, uh, malaria because mosquitoes can now survive, at higher, at higher elevations and, and other, other things, uh, we know that there are gonna be more pandemics. So this is not gonna be uh, the first or the last. Uh, uh, so that's number two. And then number three, um, the, the case for alliances, right? One of the, the, the more troubling things in the last couple of years is the extent to which, you know, the post-World War II alliance order is fraying and dissolving. And our commitment to NATO, our commitment to other alliances is in, is in question. Uh, and how valuable those are. Uh, WHO, I mean, the fact that we're making, that we've you know, indicated we're gonna pull out WHO at a time where we actually need to be collaborating and sharing information more with the rest of the world uh, and working more with anybody who's willing to work with us uh, and not turning our back is a major problem. And then the last piece um, on this, uh, I, I think we uh, have to look really hard at whether or not there needs to be a convention or treaty on pandemics, right? Now, early in my legal career, I actually was a trade sanctions lawyer, so uh, I know a thing a, a little, little bit, just enough to be dangerous on Iranian sanctions and other kind of sanctions, the chemical weapons treaties and others. We actually know how to do this, right? The, the, this isn't a wheel that we need to reinvent. There are well-established conventions and treaties that have monitoring, that are, that are voluntary, uh, that have um, uh, carrots and sticks, uh, so that as, you know, as, as a disease pops up somewhere, we could send in monitors, uh, and look at it and get our arms around it. And if people don't comply, then there are uh, sanctions, you know, very specific sanctions that can apply. 
there, there are, there are uh, well-defined ways of doing this. And I actually do think that we need to take a hard look at whether or not a, a pandemic treaty or convention uh, is going to be a way of dealing with this as a global community. Congressman, again, thank you so very much for uh, spending the time with us, again, uh, for your service to the country. Um, uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to engage with you uh, in the months and years to come. It's stay safe. Thank you. Thanks for your continued service, all of you. Good to see you. And I'll have my staff uh, share uh, my contact information with the commission members. I'd love to stay in touch with all of you uh, and share ideas and see how I can be helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right, okay. so we've, we've had a, uh, a, a good educational day. We've heard from 10 panelists. We've had a, from a wide range of disciplines and expertise and from a wide range of states and territory and from the tribes. And um, we've looked into the past and the present and the future of this issue. And uh, I think it's been a good, uh, a well-structured day. Thank you, Asha, and all of the staff. And I will now yield back to Joe. I think it's been a great day. And I thank you, Asha, and your team for putting this uh, group of witnesses together. They're really uh, impressive, had great experience, and they, I think, were helpful uh, to us. And, um, you know, there's, uh, I come back to what I said at the beginning, I, I still think we should go back and look at an I, the idea, look for a, a better idea or more ideas about how to organize this uh, biodefense enterprise in the federal government. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Stay healthy. Great.